Yeah, I think we can go, David. Okay, are we ready? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I wish to wel welcome you all to the last day of our conference. Uh, I am David Rasmussen. I am uh, Emeritus Professor from Boston College in Philosophy. And um, I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Philosophy and Social Criticism. Uh, around 2008, uh, Giancarlo and Nina persuaded me uh, to start publishing the uh, materials of the conference, which means the papers that everybody presents. And we have done that for the last um, 11 years. Uh, uh, the last one being the 2019 conference, which Volker is holding up at the moment. Uh, and it can be um, uh, it can be distributed. We're talking about the way in which it, uh, generally it was distributed at the conference itself, but we're talking about the way in which it will be distributed now. Um, uh, it's been quite a privilege for me to uh, do this um, over the years. Uh, we've had very distinguished people. And I should also mention um, that now, where is it? Oh, yes, here it is that we have a, a book which um, uh, uh, Shayla Benabib and Volker Call uh, edited called Toward a New Democratic Imaginaries, Istanbul Seminars on Islam, Culture and Politics, which came out in 2016. Um, so, uh, and it's in a series that uh, 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 Alessandro Ferrara and I edited, edit called um, uh, philosophy and politics. And um, uh, you could pick, oh, there it is right there. So um, in, uh, in any case, there's quite a record of what uh, we have done in these conferences. And uh, now it is my privilege to introduce the speakers today. They are uh, Raman Jahan Bigelow uh, and Craig Calhoun. Um, uh, Raman is um, presently uh, in New Delhi, where he um, is pretty much confined, as he just told us a minute ago. Uh, uh, he is the executive director of the Gandhi Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies and the vice dean of the School of Law at Jindal Global University in New Delhi, India. Um, he is, of course, the author of a number, a vast number of books and articles. And he has been uh, a participant in, in this group uh, uh, in several sessions. Uh, and I will say something about Craig at the, also at this point. Uh, Craig Calhoun, um, Jose introduced him as the president of everything two days ago. Uh, he is uh, an American sociologist, currently university professor of social sciences at Arizona State University. And it is of some significance that he was the actual director, which I believe means the head of the London School of uh, Economics and Political Science uh, from September uh, 19, uh, 2012 to September 2016. The title of uh, uh, Raman's talk will be The Individual and Community a non-violent perspective. Raman, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning to uh, those of you who are in, uh, in North America and uh, I, this evening here in uh, Delhi. Uh, very happy uh, to be with you, some of the old friends again. And uh, I uh, thank uh, Voltaire and Giancarlo and Sophia and others for this invitation. Now, I've been following uh, the speakers uh, in the previous days uh, as I could, and listening to uh, Michael Walz, uh, Shelo Ben Habib, and some of our other participants in our conference, I can't say that I get the feeling that uh, we are living right now in the best of the worlds. Uh, quite the contrary, 
I think we are standing between two worlds, a world that is gradually passing away and a world that is being born. And we stand between the, the dying, I would say, old and the emerging new. Now, I'm not very optimistic like some of you about the emerging new, especially because the world looks more and more uh, upside down. So, and as the growing uh, pandemic uh, shows us, uh, the democratic community, uh, which we are concerned with, uh, seems uh, tragically unprepared to jointly address the growing global challenges to democracy. Uh, it looks like we have lost uh, our chart. It looks like we have lost our compass. It looks like we need some North Star, Northern Star to guide us into a future which is shrouded with a lot of uncertainties. I also think that the coronavirus uh, crisis uh, confronted us with a series of questions which demand and necessitate a redefinition of, as we're doing it actually, we've been doing it in the past few days, a redefinition of the concepts of individual and community. Now, I think among, uh, there are three questions that are the most crucial and closely related to our present situation. And I, I saw that in most of the, in the presentations, uh, these questions were present. Uh, the first question, how to mobilize responsibility. Second question, how to strengthen solidarity. And third question, which has been on my mind for uh, at least 20, 25 years, how to democratize democracies, what I call democratization of democracies. Well, I do not have, of course, the pretension to uh, answer all these questions in 20, 25 minutes, uh, but I do think that in the long run, our world will need to try to confront these questions and find uh, some answers. And this is where uh, what I call the nonviolent democratic theory could be of a great help to redefine the concepts which, with which we've been working like individual community, democracy and other things uh, by correcting the shortcomings of uh, liberalism, communitarianism, of conservatism and many other uh, ideologies and modes of thinking. I think one of the key things of the nonviolent democratic theory, if I can put it in this way, in the past hundred years has been the theme of democratization of democracy. And this has been the centerpiece of the American civil rights movement with uh, Dr. King who called for the right to protest uh, for rights. Now, I will, I will be talking about King and Gandhi because uh, I've written something like 10 books on both of them. And I've been working on them for a long period of time and have been meeting with people who have worked with them actually. Uh, so the right to protest for rights. And so it's not only the liberal tradition of rights but also the old tradition of dissent, which, I, which is in the, in the, at the heart. Uh, of uh, nonviolent democratic theory. A central part of this narrative of dissent, which I would distinguish from a pure Leninist voluntarism, uh, is based on what um, another man, another African American, uh, who's not quoted all the time, Bayard Rustin, called sound political philosophy and a responsible strategy. I like very much the idea of responsible strategy. And if you know Rustin, you know, you remember that Rustin said about the 1963 March on Washington that uh, it was a success because it was a responsible strategy, a responsible strategy. Now, two years later in 65, Martin Luther King Jr. referred to the civil rights movement in America as one expression of a social democratic revolution. These are his own words. He said, call it, I quote him, call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country, which he meant, of course, the US. And you remember two days ago, what Michael Walzer said in his talk uh, in the first day of our conference, he said, 
I remember exactly what he said. What we need is an old fashioned social movement led by some of the unions focused on organizing. Now, this is exactly why we need to go back and read MLK, uh, because MLK suggested more than half a century ago how to democratize American democracy. And so we can talk about nonviolent democratic theory as what I call integral democracy. Uh, my, some of you might not like the term integral democracy. Because why integral? Because both Gandhi and King, they are theorists of democracy, but they're also practitioners. You know, it's not always that we have practitioners of democracy in the, uh, at the same level as theorists. And they believe that um, liberal democracy, uh, liberalism has to be corrected and we have to go beyond it. So moreover, when Gandhi and King write explicitly about community, they reject all forms of animic community uh, or what um, King uh, in some of his writings and speeches, he talks about broken community, which I think is actually the case of our uh, world. Uh, it is a community which uh, tolerates and perpetuates patterns of social inequality and exclusion. As such, for them, I mean, for uh, both um, Gandhi and King, integral democracy entails more than communal harmony or desegregation, it entails integration and inclusion which King defines as what he calls welcomed participation into the total range of human activities. Welcome participation into the total range of human activities. Uh, for MLK, the full integration of the individual into a community and what he calls the beloved community, of course, those of you who are familiar with his work, it constitutes a threefold demand. Uh, first of all, it demands full respect for the dignity and worth of personality. As you know, King was a personalist. He was very much influenced by the uh, philosophy of personalism. Secondly, it demands freedom as the empowerment to engage in responsible decision-making. And thirdly, the theme which has been on our minds in this conference, it demands solidarity or the mutually cooperative and voluntary venture of man to assume a semblance of responsibility for the other citizens. So I think both Gandhi and King attempted to provoke Indian and American societies into a radical transformation of their political values and their institutional patterns. And certainly it would be correct to consider Gandhi and King as principal champions of nonviolent methods of social change. But I think we should also take into consideration the fact that their intellectual reflections and social practices were directly uh, directed towards the human community and not only uh, Indian or American society. Now, I believe that the Gandhian and Kingian democratic theories are especially relevant in a post-coronavirus or post-pandemic world where we are confronted uh, with a crisis of democratic leadership and a crisis of citizen responsibility. Gandhi's insistence on an enlightened citizenship, what he calls an enlightened citizenship, is particularly interesting for our post-pandemic world which is suffering from a lack, lack of what I would call a democratic passion. I think that Gandhi has some interesting points on the ethical renewal of democracy in terms of character building, uh, underlying character building, because he's one of the rare uh, thinkers in 20th century who's talking not only about nation building, state building, civil society, but also about character building. Uh, which can be very useful for a new democratic theory which tries to think beyond, again, liberalism and communitarianism. Gandhi actually believed that the true test of democracy is the degree to which it is able to inculcate ethical values in the character of an individual. Uh, he's, he's very close to the, to the Greeks and the, in this term, actually. 
actually he read the Greeks and he translated uh, Plato. This reminds me also of uh, Arendt and what Arendt says because it's very similar uh, to what Arendt says in uh, Freedom to be Free because she says that if you remember well, she talks about the desire to excel. And uh, what uh, is so interesting in her, she says that the tyrant doesn't need to excel. And that's why the tyrant does not have this passion uh, for politics. And he doesn't want to be in company of others, but those who have the desire to excel, uh, they love the company of their peers and they spur into the public uh, sphere. So this desire to excel, goes hand in hand with one's consciousness about one's fragility. And if we consider democracy uh, as action and freedom, therefore it is only when citizens act freely that they become conscious of their political fragility, as I can say, and ethical weaknesses. And this is what King and Gandhi showed the citizens, both in America and in India, that they are fragile, but they also have these weaknesses. Uh, the problem with our liberal democracies, I think, in today's world is that they have dismissed what I will call the nobility of character and spirit. It's really a shame that in most of the liberal, even countries, I'm not talking, of course, about countries like Iran and uh, these are uh, awful uh, regimes, but I'm talking about those countries like in Europe or in, uh, in North America, where uh, in politics, you don't have any more this mobility of character and spirit. And there is this lack of democratic passion, uh, which is, and also the lack of the virtue to excel, I would say in the Arendtian sense. But political fragility of humans and communities are not also taken into account anymore. And that is why the idea, ideas that King and Gandhi talk about uh, like self-sacrifice or suffering for the other are no more meaningful in this, uh, in our democratic theory. Now, there are several points here which we can find in both Gandhi and King and which are crucial to our debates on democracy and democratization. The, four, the first point that I mentioned is political leadership. Um, Michael Walz and Sheila ben didn't talk much about political leadership. They just went on the surface. I think it's very important. The current pandemic showed us that we are confronted with a lack of political and moral leadership around the world, especially moral leadership. And I think that we all agree that most of our political leaders around the world are completely incapable of well understanding and managing the political fragility that I was really talking about. Uh, the form, therefore, the form of leadership which is missing the most in today's world is what I will call an empathetic leadership, which can evolve through experiments and through understanding and through redressing sufferings and grievances of others, or let's say humanity. And this brings me immediately to my second point, which is pointed out by MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., and that is what he calls, I quote him, an overriding loyalty to mankind, an overriding loyalty to mankind. Very Kantian, actually. Uh, I think democratic politics cannot survive without loyalty to the principle of democracy. And uh, King, in his last writing before his assassination, which is called, Where Do We Go From Here? He argues the following. He says, every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. So that's so interesting because it says it puts the particular in the universal. And I believe this idea of loyalty to mankind could stand strongly as the core foundation of the concept of solidarity that we've been talking about and the idea of universal harmony among communities. Now, this idea of loyalty to mankind is totally absent among the leaders that we know. Uh, people like Trump, Orban, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, Putin, and many others. And the third point is that for King and Gandhi, 
implicit in democracy is the upholding of the ethic of human action. And of course, solidarity is an advancing of that very ethic. But solidarity is not just a promise of compassion. It is actually what we call the wake of responsibility. We can call it the wake of responsibility. Both uh, Michael Walzer and Shelo Ben Habib pointed to the concept of solidarity in their presentations. Michael said that we need a re new recognition of solidarity across classes after the pandemic. And Shela said that we need solidarity, care, and sacrifice. She actually mentioned these three concepts. And it's interesting that in both Gandhi and King's visions of community, you can find the idea of solidarity, which is based on the primacy of human dignity. How can there be an interest for the world which we inhabit and share with others if the idea of human dignity is not valued? Now, pointing to uh, the pandemic, Shela said that people have become victims of their global greed which is very correct, actually, I think. I wrote it also in another Times in a, an article around a, a month and a half ago. Uh, and I do believe that uh, this global greed, this culture of celebrity, as we call it, has replaced the idea of human dignity. So what does it mean when I, we say that in a world of pandemic, we are responsible for the individuals in our community? What does it mean? Well, responsibility, I think, is that fundamental point from which all human interconnectedness grows and by which it stands or falls. And it's the center of gravity of what King calls a socially conscious democracy, a socially conscious democracy, which according to him, reconciles the self-determination of the individual and the recognition of shared values in the community. So it's interesting how Gandhi and King as nonviolent theorists of democracy they found an ontological concern for the global human condition beyond national and religious communities. And they both strive for a richer vision of humanity in an interconnected and interdependent world. And that's why they, I think we have to go back and read them and use them for today's post-pandemic uh, world. Uh, King also envisioned what he called a world house based on what he, uh, what he called the uh, cosmic companionship, if you have read him, uh, read him. Uh, it's very interesting. He talks about cosmic uh, companionship. I think it's kind of an Aristotelian civic friendship beyond national borders, I would call it. Uh, now, uh, to go uh, quickly, because I want to get to your questions, uh, what is important for them, which is important for us, is actually, based on cross-cultural dialogue and people-to-people -people contacts, uh, more than the state-to-state -state contacts. And so uh, difference with the uh, liberal thought here is that they both insist on the necessity of human interconnectedness worldwide, and not only in terms of the economy, not in terms of the market as we know it, but in terms of duties and not only rights. Uh, King and Gandhi, they both talk about global shared duties, which creates this interconnectedness. And that's why they believe both, and this is actually put on paper by King, in what they call a revolution of values, which I think is more an ethical imperative to attain a community of responsible and duty-oriented individuals. Now, it is interesting that when we get to King, and uh, it's important to go on back and read him, King in his writings, when he's talking about this interrelatedness and interconnectedness, he refers to a single garment of destiny where individuals are supposed to be indebted to each other. So I like also this idea uh, of indebtedness. Human beings uh, politically and socially and morally they are indebted to each other. Uh, if I can um, read you and uh, quote you one uh, other uh, point from uh, King, uh, maybe you know that, it's very interesting. King, uh, he has a quote uh, to talk about this indebtedness and he says, when we rise in the morning, when we, we rise in the morning, we go into the bathroom where we reach for a sponge 
which is provided by us by a passive by language. Then we reach for soap that is created for us by European. Then at the table, we drink coffee, which is provided for us, for us by a South American or tea by a Chinese or cocoa by a West African. So before we leave for our jobs, we are already beholden to more than half of the world. So you see how he portrays and uh, the, the image of this uh, interconnectedness uh, is actually some kind of a network of mutuality, which again, he calls a single garment of uh, destiny. Now to uh, conclude, uh, I think that uh, since we are, we've been uh, actually talking about globalization for the rapid globalization in the past 20 years, and I think that the whole problem uh, comes from there because uh, globalization is not only about the economic market, but it's also about tourism, terrorism, pandemics, uh, all the issues which come with it. Uh, the most, one of the points which have been always been absent is the ethical point in globalization. And that's why we, it's, it's one of the shortcomings I think that we have, we need to go back to, uh, King and Gandhi, because they are completely deceived by the utilitarian and individualistic tendencies of modern democracies. Now, this is why the recurrent theme in the uh, theories of democracy is the self-realization of the individual. Uh, for example, in Gandhi's theory of democracy, citizens are supposed to be self-conscious and self-transformative. Uh, and this is what he calls Swaraj, to rule oneself, meaning having a capacity of self-governance, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, in other words, Gandhi's self-rule should influence not only the inner life of the individual, but uh, his or her public life uh, also. And I think here uh, you have not only political obligations, uh, but also, again, moral obligations, according to Gandhi and King, to fight against conformism and complacency, which are the two evils of our world and our democracies. And this is where I think Gandhi's conception of democracy becomes very relevant and significant to our contemporary political theory. Why? Because uh, I think that uh, both King and Gandhi, uh, and Gandhi, they had an evolutionary vision of inclusive democracy. And they explicitly uh, disapproved uh, what um, Anani was talking about the other day, which is a direct reference in uh, politics to either national, ethnic, cultural, or religious uh, dogmas or ideologies. And so I think to end, um, what uh, is important, I, I look forward to your questions on that. Uh, the, the interesting point in, in, in the way I use Gandhi and King and for not just for India and uh, for uh, America, but also for the Middle East, uh, is that for them, democracy is an unfinished project. And that's also very interesting. It's an unfinished project because it needs permanently to be transformed, as King says beautifully, from thin paper to thick action from thin paper to thick action. And of course, uh, this is where I think that um, uh, we need to go back and to, in, especially in our post pandemic situation today, go back and read them and uh, see if we can use it as a new uh, mental outlook uh, to uh, the new situation that we have uh, in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Um, now we're open for questions. Do I see any questions? There's um, one on the chat from uh, Gabrielle and Sinas. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, I don't have the chat. Okay, um, I can read it out. He says- Why don't you read it aloud? He says, thank you for a very timely topic and thank you. Oh, okay, I've got it. Test. Any comment on the current protests in the US after the death of George Floyd? Should I respond? Yep. 
I've got them now. Yes. Yes. Yes, I, uh, it's interesting because uh, I was watching the news uh, on uh, French TV uh, uh, and um, I was practically sure when I was, I was practically sure that there's going to be a question if I talked about King, there's going to be a, a question about uh, Minneapolis and what's going on in Minneapolis and Minnesota. Uh, I think that uh, Somebody like King, I mean, say more than Gandhi, because uh, Gandhi is concerned more with what's happening in India rather than in the United States of America. Though, uh, for most of you, uh, you certainly know that Gandhi, before King discovered Gandhi, Gandhi had been read uh, for a long period of time by the Black Americans, by African Americans in the 1920s and 1930s. So there has been a tradition of nonviolence before King among the African Americans. Now, I think that uh, uh, since the um, issue of Rodney King and many others which have been uh, repeating themselves, I think that uh, it shows that the relevance, it shows the relevance of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in today's uh, problems for the United States, not only in terms of, and that's why you see, you saw, I did not intensify and in, uh, emphasize too much on racism and desegregation because uh, eventually I think that this, this is not the only narrative uh, which is important in nonviolent democratic theory, especially when we are talking about Martin Luther King Jr. But uh, social equality, which is very important, inclusion, which is very, very important, and uh, the, the idea of, um, of American democracy itself I'm really always surprised by the level of the readings of Martin Luther King in 1955-56 when he starts uh, his movement in Montgomery and the boss by bus and how he talks about American democracy and he goes back to this idea of American dream and uh, and uh, so I think that uh, the problem that we are seeing today in, in Minneapolis is not only a problem of racism or policemen attacking blacks. It's a, it's a, it's a more uh, important uh, problem, which has to do with the essence of American democracy, which needs to uh, reflect on itself. Of course, with somebody like Donald Trump is difficult, but uh, I think that it's possible uh, to do it in, in American civil society. We, we have a question from Alessandro. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ramin, can you see me? Yes, yes. Yes, hi, great to How see you. you. After a long time, you gave us a, a very nice uh, rendition of the message, somehow the teaching of these two great figures, uh, 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 Gandhi and, um, and Martin Luther King. I wonder uh, whether you could place them uh, I, as I was listening to you, I was um, uh, recalling in my mind a famous Weberian uh, dichotomy, uh, distinction of ethical prophecy and exemplary prophecy. Now, the ethical prophet is somebody who has a teaching, a moral and a religious teaching, and in this case, it is the nonviolent practice of democracy. And uh, the ethical prophet teaches but not, doesn't practice it. Uh, deviates from what he preaches. And then you have the solitary uh, seeker of perfection that doesn't care about preaching and disseminating his uh, enlightenment. And these two figures are key because they're the, in a way, the living examples of exemplary prophecy. You mentioned uh, teaching about nonviolent democracy and practicing it at the same time. And I wonder whether this is exactly in a way why they managed to reach universally uh, through many constituencies that are across uh, so many different cultural divides and political divides and yet are inspired by what they're doing. And what they're doing has this exemplary quality of teaching by example, by the coincidence of the normative aspect and the practice they were doing. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, also, we find this in a way, in a, in a place where you would never suspect to find it. And uh, you mentioned political leadership and I wanna hook up briefly to that. 
you will find that teaching in an area where you will never suspect it in the theory of in the theory of management aiming directed at advising firms corporations uh, uh, there is a current of that peter drucker is the main one of the leading uh, of management by example that stresses the fact that being a manager which is a synonym for in that world for being a leader requires integrity if you don't have integrity you can't manage anything you can you cannot lead so leadership is uh, integrity and i think these two characters uh, also teach us that thing that in a world where uh, where uh, leaders are often often cynical they don't believe what they preach again uh, integrity is the key thing one last thing is, uh, it's more of a comment. You mentioned that uh, uh, Martin Luther King was a personalist and also there are echoes of Arendt in, in his idea of democracy. And I wanted to just add the name of Dewey, uh, which you didn't mention, because Dewey has this wonderful uh, fragment of, on democracy, creative democracy, the task before us, 1939, where he says, Democracy, this I'm quoting from him, is a personal way of individual life. It signifies the possession and continual use of certain attitudes, forming personal character and determining desire and purpose in all the relations of life. So instead of thinking of our disposition as habits as accommodated to certain institutions, on the other hand, on the, on the opposite, we have to learn to think of the latter of the institutions as expressions, projections and extensions of habitually dominant personal attitudes. Both of your heroes, Gandhi and-, uh, and Okay. Uh, let's and, uh, and, and Martin Luther let's, King. Let's get to the answer. Okay. Can I answer? Are you finished? Yes, it's just I a comment. Said, yes. Okay. Yes. But this is a very long uh, question. I mean, uh, of course, uh, you have things to say. Uh, <laughs> because it's, um, it's divided between, I mean, uh, there are so many things in it. Um, I, I apologize if I don't take all of them. Uh, but, um, you know, um, let's talk about political leadership. And you refer me to a broker. I can even add somebody like Jack Welch, General Electric, and those. You know, I worked with a consultancy firm in Canada uh, while I was teaching at the University of Toronto uh, part time uh, because they were interested to, uh, uh, to work with me. And um, I was really surprised by the fact that they only know their own stuff and they don't know anything else. You know, they don't read books and they don't know about literature, poetry, music, they don't know. They, they, they only know about how to do consult, consultancy and how to win, you know, at, at this, but it's, it's good stuff, as you said. I mean, it's, it works. Strategies in businesses work. However, I, the big problem where actually Dewey is a, is a good representative of it, and he's very closely on that, in that sense, to somebody like King and Gandhi, is that for Dewey, uh, dem democracy doesn't go without education, as you know. Education is so important in his philosophy, is at the center of it, actually. And for both King and Gandhi, education is, plays a very important role. Why? Because they knew that citizens need to be educated. People need to be educated about, about compassion. They need to be educated about uh, empathy. They need to be educated not only about laws and justice, but also about the manner of treating the other. This is, there is a beautiful quote by King uh, uh, addressing the blacks, uh, African-Americans. He's saying, if the whites cannot love you, teach them how to love you by loving them. This is a form of education. It's a, it's a education of citizenry. Now, we have the whole point that I have that, and the pandemic shows us, is that we don't have any more uh, public education, where in the sense that we don't have citizen education. Even we were not well educated by the, the, the states, actually didn't educate us well about the pandemic. They just sent us into confinement. Why? Because somebody like Boris Johnson is not educated himself. How can he educate the citizens in the UK? when he himself doesn't understand the A from, he cannot distinguish the A from Z. Uh, so the, where King and 
Gandhi become important, and I, I believe really in nonviolent democratic theory, is not only in their own countries, but outside when you have transition from dictatorship to democracy. As we saw it in the Arab Spring, they were living more, they were reading more we, as in Iran and elsewhere. You know? Thank you. We have a question. We have a question from Israel Barroso. Israel? Your question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Are you muted? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So yes, I'm we can hear you now. Microphone. But okay. So thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's funny because you uh, now with uh, answering to Professor Ferrara, you uh, you arrived in, in in what would be my question. I, I wanted to talk exactly about education and, and the importance of education, because uh, so I, I will reframe a little bit my question um, in order to push a little bit forward this. And I, I'll take the example of my home country, which is Brazil, uh, to, because I, I completely agree with you. I think we have. Uh, this complete lack of leadership, and, and what is funny is that uh, Professor Ferrara mentioned the the language of, of manager uh, of managers and so on. And it's funny that uh, many uh, many people in Brazil, but also around the world, uh, apply or uh, or use this language in order to um, to get to push for for um, the, the meritocratic uh, to the meritocratic system and, and, and all, all the bunch of things that we know about capitalism and functioning, but they completely miss out that uh, the language of leadership to which they appeal to uh, is, is missing completely uh, in, in, the, in the politicians they, they, they agree with and they vote for. So we have in Bolsonaro, for example, we don't have a leader, we have what is a, a chief, the, the, the army chief or something like this, much more authoritarian is than, than leadership. Now, what is my question is um, how to engage these people in this democratic uh, dialogical process? Because if we talk about the, the democratic the democracy and nonviolent dialogue, so we are not appealing to revolution or something else, how to engage these people who do not want to be educated, who do not want dialogue? So uh, Martin Luther King and Gandhi were uh, masters in this, but um, I think that they, uh, they, they appeal to a language, to, to concepts that were uh, the most, uh, in, uh, the long, the very long uh, um, and, and uh, wide and broad concepts such as liberty and equality in the case of, of uh, Martin Luther King, equality and, and liberty in the case of Gandhi, and now we have this third uh, principle, the, the fraternity or the solidarity, who is missing. But living in this world, which uh, uh, many people do not want to engage in, in dialogue, and in which this solidarity is, is somewhat uh, very uh, difficult to address, who are we addressing to when we talk about a global solidarity? So how, how to engage these people in, in okay. this dialogue? Can we finish the question? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's the question. I mean, uh, if, if you if you have some insights about that, Wrong. how to engage then? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, in my experiences around the world, uh, um, I, I, I saw how you can apply this nonviolent democratic theory uh, to um, different situations. Now, some of these situations are more difficult than others. Even now in today's world, I mean, uh, while you were talking, uh, an Indian was uh, sending us a message about uh, how the BJP and the Hindu uh, government uh, are uh, misusing their power uh, to kill the civil liberties in India. Well, you know, in many of the, if this uh, person had read some of the articles that I published in India, I always refer to Gandhi as a dissenter. And the fact that Gandhi is today, if, if Gandhi is read and uh, if Gandhi is uh, taught correctly, Gandhi is actually uh, enemy number one of any form of fanaticism, dogmatism, fundamentalism. He has always been, that's why he was assassinated. Same with King actually, in the problem that uh, somebody asked about what's going on right now in uh, Minnesota. Uh, King is always present. You know, something that the followers of King and those who worked with him, he couldn't, they couldn't do. 
Jesse Jackson was not able to do it. Andrew Young was not able to do it. John Lewis was a congressman, a very uh, nice man, but they were not able to have this leadership as King had. Uh, why? Because I think that this is very special about, uh, of course, again, the character building is so important. You know, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about democracy without referring to character building. Uh, I think character building is very important. And the Athenians, they knew that very well. I mean, uh, when we go back and uh, we read uh, the Athenians, we, the Greeks, uh, we understand that for them also this moral character, virtue, uh, every excellence, everything, uh, Haresia, you know, Frank being Frank and, and uh, how to, uh, I, I talk about those elements are so important that they are missing in today's politics and of course in, uh, in the leaderships uh, around the world. Yes. We're going to have to um, um, ask the final questions. We only have a couple of minutes. Um, Volker, okay. you had a question, is that correct? Y yes, let me see. I'm, okay, Volker? just quickly, yeah, yeah. Just Otherwise, quickly. there is another, okay, let's. Uh, very quickly, it, quickly. Very quickly, it, it goes, so, so I'm very sympathetic with your moral perfectionism, which was also brought up yesterday by Brombal and Murigi. But what I was, what I'm, I'm personally concerned about, how does that catch up with the structural uh, inequalities and the, let's say, institutional injustices that we face? I mean, how can a perfectionist position counter, after all, let's say, those structural injustices that we face? I think this is a very Rousseauist question. Very briefly. And, huh? Sorry? I think this is a, I think, I think. The, Go ahead, like, very, quick, very quickly. I'm, I'm saying, I'm, 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 I'm answering the question. I, I think that uh, Rousseau had actually a good answer to it, which uh, we can say that is taken by Gandhi and uh, King also in their manner of doing it, which is, how it's, it's the virtue of the man, of the, of the, of the human being, but at the, at the citizen at the same time. So how you educate the person, uh, even if uh, there's a situation of inequality, uh, you might be able, and this is the whole uh, of, uh, communal, uh, you know, work of uh, Gandhi in the, in the villages and elsewhere, or uh, King uh, to go and uh, work in the South uh, with the older black population is how you can civically educate them and bring them we, to this uh, idea. Sorry, David, what are you saying? We have, so, one, we yes? have one final question, uh, uh -huh. which, which is from Dr. Nasser. Uh, it is secular democracies like India are witnessing the darkest period today under the right wing BJP government where all moralistic Gandhian ideas have become the thing of the past. You think in such a darkest area of democracy, there is still room for moral revival. How can we assess the success and failure of democracy when it fails to be moral while being a consumerist heaven? Yes, That's I the think final I, question. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, the final question, the final answer would be, Yes, but it's not only in India, it's many, many places. It's also in uh, Brazil, it's also uh, in many places that we're seeing what's happening. Uh, I mean, uh, this conference was all about it, about the fact that how our civil liberties are uh, being uh, shrouded and destroyed uh, with us just uh, sitting and uh, watching and how they're, they're destroying our civil liberties. So. Uh, the whole point is, how can we go back and ask the right question? Now, I think that it's nothing is, could be more tragic uh, than to live in a time that we need change and we need to think about change and we do not have the possibility of making these changes or change our attitudes. And I think people like Gandhi and King, what they teach us is that we need to change our values and we need to change our attitudes. Thank you very much, Raman. It was a wonderful talk and um, very timely. Um, and now we'll turn to Craig Calhoun. Um, 
Craig, I gather you're here. I don't think you were there at the beginning, but I did introduce you. Uh, and um, so I will uh, go directly to the talk. It's good to see you again. Um, and Craig, uh, uh, the name of the, uh, the title of his uh, lecture will be Physical Distance and Social Connection. Craig Calhoun. Oh, your microphone, Craig. Yeah. Is my presentation your, visible here? My, your microphone, yeah. I've, I've unmuted the microphone, yes. but is the PowerPoint yes, visible? Yes, it is. Ah, good. Um, so thanks very much, yes, David. Um, and thanks to the organizers. And uh, good early morning for me. It has gone from dark to dawn while I've been sitting here for the last uh, little while. Good afternoon to <clears> others. I want to begin literally with the experience of the conference and this experience of being in a virtual space that is not any place. Uh, it's something that has been highlighted for us in the context of the coronavirus. We are having Zoom conferences all the time. We look at people's faces. Sometimes we are able to recognize someone we have had a relationship with in quote real space, but um, sometimes these are new people. We've acknowledged it's different. We're acutely aware in this of the idea of social distancing and of disruptions to our social life. To foreshadow my presentation, I'm going to argue that we need to think further about this and specifically about the ways in which we are socially distant, even when we are physically proximate, the ways in which inequality and other divisions um, work even on face-to-face -face relations and on um, close. We need to think about the insufficiency of any theories based on face-to-face -face relations and proximity in a world of larger scale but we also need to think about how we value face-to-face -face community and other relationships. And we see that now in the context of the pandemic. We long for a variety of kinds of conviviality and social gatherings that we miss in various ways. People miss sporting events, though Atalanta is criticized as having been a spreader of the virus in Italy. Right. We miss cafe life. Um, as intellectuals in particular, we sort of imagine there can be no philosophy if there are no cafes, um, that uh, we are hugely um, bereft if we don't have these modes of convivial gathering with each other. So social disruption here is dramatic, but the phrase social distancing can be somewhat misleading. Um, it's physical distancing we're talking about, and we need to ask about its social effects. And then I want to say there's also other kinds of material distancing, like radical inequalities. Some of these are laid bare in the context of the pandemic, as we're aware of the differences between people who can work comfortably at home and people who necessarily are out um, working as healthcare. Um, delivery or working as physical goods delivery, and in either case, exposed in ways we aren't. We're aware of people less comfortable. So we need a category of recognizing the material distances that are real, as well as the physical distances that have to do with proximity. But physical distance is powerful. This is what we mean, so not social entirely. Here are a class of people, Air Force cadets in the United States, graduating with um, distancing, right? but graduating into a very cohesive social category of new officers in the Air Force. So we try, most of us, to limit how much our social distance um, is increased by physical distancing. We check in on our family and friends. There are new sorts of standard lines in emails as we write to everybody and say, oh, how are you despite the terrible things that are going on? 
whole neighborhoods join in various ways in this celebrating um, some sort of community, possibly community they weren't celebrating outside the context of the COVID pandemic, sometimes thanking um, health workers and others. But we note that there is loss, right? We've noted um, recurrently in this workshop that we regret not being together in person. There are side conversations, serendipitous connections that don't get made. So we place an enormous value on physically proximate forms of sociality, not just in relation to the pandemic, but in general. The pandemic reveals to us some values that we may not always have articulated. So we care a great deal about this. I want to suggest this is in a way um, a modern predicament that we care enormously, of, in fact, in many ways more about physically proximate forms of sociality precisely because there is a construction of social order so distant from these. Take teaching, right? Um, what happens to our teaching? And do we have some opportunity for a wonderful online future in which there's greater access to university? Do we have only a frustrating adaptation to necessity? What does this mean? Many people are determined to reopen universities no matter what it takes. Um, there's a fear among faculty members of a transition permanently to online instruction and the potential that this will be incorporated into the business model of universities as a basis for um, having professors teach more students and then have fewer professors and so forth. But listen to this quote, which comes from a um, uh, workshop held by the National Academy of Sciences in the US just a few days ago from the president of Purdue University. He says, we are going to reopen in the fall because we think the experience of being together is crucial to education. But there will be a minimum distance of 10 feet between any professor and the nearest student. The student will be wearing a mask and the professor will be behind a plexiglass shield. So what has he said? At once, <laughs> we really need to be together and we are going to introduce these extraordinary measures to limit the significance of being together, at least for our health, but undoubtedly for our social interaction too, right? Now it's not like all lectures were intimate occasions. When we talk about online versus face-to-face -face education, we tend to imagine the face-to-face -face as the tutorial or the seminar, not the gigantic lecture the 3,500 students getting a physics lesson in China or all too familiar um, images of um, teaching without personal relationships. So we need to recognize that this was already a complicated trade-off. Being in the same space doesn't guarantee cohesion or intimacy. Now, if this were a seminar on higher education, I would go on to talk about all the other things involved the trade-offs about access, the pressures for exclusivity, the way rankings influence universities in a prestige competition and indeed budgets. But this isn't a lecture about education. I want to use the familiar educational example as a path into the complexity in thinking about proximity, distance, scale, and the very forms of social relations. How do we relate to each other when we are in face-to-face -face settings when we are in um, very large scale mediated interactions and in various other scales in between. Uh, I want to appropriate, but I'm also going to suggest we need to go beyond Habermas's famous distinction between system and life world. This is crucial, but we're also going to need to think more about things that are neither system nor life world and I would suggest in many ways, this is where institutions come in. Debates over liberalism and communitarianism that we've been called to re-engage in this conference um, are conducted with remarkably little attention to these factors of scale and distance. Um, we, are, we tend to have in these debates in political theory the illusion that there is no great difference between ancient Athens 
and the contemporary world. Right? But we need much more attention to how social connections are formed and are maintained over physical distance at very large scale. We know this, of course, because we know nations and nationalism and international relations are important in a way they weren't in ancient Athens. We know politics is mediated and hugely dependent on various kinds of media. So we talk about TV, we talk about social media, but this set of issues hasn't penetrated fully a debate like liberalism and communitarianism. And in a way, the terms of that debate are inhibited from taking seriously the forms of large scale integration. So issues of populism are framed in this context, I think. The social foundations of democracy demand that we look at this. So we have to get to these issues of actual social organization. It's not just that life world is colonized by system, it's that the whole world is transformed by scale. And here's my simple example. Um, sort of, it is crude and simple, but it's not without meaning. Right? The number of people in the classical Republican city-states, whether ancient Greek or Renaissance Italian, is a tiny fraction of the number of people in modern democracies. The adaptation being made in forming modern democracies, um, bringing the Republican idea into modern democracies is an adaptation not only to being a little bit more democratic. Right? Plato thought democracy was um, ma rule, um, at, you know, populism as in its worst forms. Right? Um, I suggested two days ago, we should think of Savonarola as one of the first great populists the beginning of the modern era. We have some problematic images even in these small scale societies. But what say the American founders do and what goes on in democracy and in the modern republics is an adaptation to scale that changes dramatically what's going on. The public sphere can't possibly look like this anymore. The face-to-face -face and the proximate still move us. They still have power, we crave them. But the world is organized on the basis of infrastructural systems, of transportation, of communication, of energy, operating at very large scale, calling, as Haberas indeed argued, for expertise, which becomes a distorting factor in politics, but also simply connecting us at huge distance, making us interdependent on very large scales and in interdependence that we are not very well prepared to recognize and understand. Markets, for example, um, are not places anymore. The market centers, they're global, but how did this come to be and what does it mean? Is it necessity, is it choice? We have a very minimal appreciation in political theory for corporations. Occasionally we say things that are basically sort of vaguely left condemnations of corporations, but we fail to see that these are a crucial kind of actor alongside nation states in constituting the modern <coughs> world alongside markets. Corporations are not markets, right? Corporations are power. They are like states in being creatures of power that act in markets, right? But what corporations internalize is precisely um, power relations that work for them more effectively than submitting everything to market. Um, so we have the terms of a discussion that are problematic. Um, and of course, we have states and other institutions. We're connected in a whole host of new and different ways. We're connected by the internet, right? shaping our seminar, but also shaping cyber attacks and fears of cyber attacks. This is a map of um, the attack threats that but from a single day, right, tracked by an internet company, right, but showing global connections of a very different kind. Community can't, in this context, look like it did for Bruegel um, in the early modern era, yet we tend to imagine community on the level, on the model of village community. So much of the communitarian imagery of community is village community and then a slippery elision to nation, as though nation were somehow village community, but much larger. That's fundamentally different. 
I won't go into this in huge detail, but it's different to have people interacting face-to-face -face in a web of networked relations, or to have a category of people who understand themselves to be similar at very large scale, in similar, for example, in possessing citizenship. And in between, there are a whole host of questions about how we can organize the senses of belonging together at different scales. So national solidarity right, can't be just a liberal project of fairness among individuals, right? but it is also needed at a scale that exceeds local place. We fundamentally mislead ourselves if we think of nations on the model of local communities. There's something different. Right? And it demands more than just categorical identities, demands effective institutions to make this work. Call this the Durkheimian moment if you want to give it a theoretical name. What, how is solidarity constructed by interdependent institutions? And people need to be linked through what I have called indirect as well as direct relations. I won't develop this point at length today, I've written about it elsewhere, but the point is simply that most of the social relationships that structure the modern world at large scale are not directly between people who know each other or even people who might know each other. So we may have some cousin that we haven't met because he lives in Australia, but we know that he's our cousin. He exists as an in a direct relational structure, right? But most modern relations are mediated by bureaucracies, by socio-technical systems, by markets, by infrastructures on a very large scale, and they are indirect in ways that are crucial. One of the things that this makes possible is the modern form of surveillance society, surveillance capitalism that is organized um, by business interests and controlling information or surveillance authoritarianism organized by state interests. But either way, the manipulation of indirect relationships that are not disclosed to the parties to them. Still, we are moved by proximity. We're moved by rubbing shoulders. We miss not rubbing shoulders, right? We're moved by crowds in a way we are not moved by public opinion polls. You can think of this on the model of the general will and the will of all, though that's only <coughs> partial analog, right? Populism is rooted in feeling the proximate people in a crowd or a community or a compelling visual image or a song, and then extending that to an imagined people much larger, but rooted crucially in that feeling of the people. And this is one reason why crowds are so important, why popul populism is always evoked in physical gatherings for 200 years, not only in print or in other mediated forms. Liberalism requires a different kind of abstraction. It's a matter of counting the opinions or votes or interests of ostensibly discrete individuals. Democracy requires both of these. We're cursed to have this quarrel rather than to work out how they relate. And it requires both of them in a sense because it requires both social cohesion and an ability to address the opinions, votes, interests of discrete individuals. Right? It requires both the feeling and the abstraction Right? And in a sense, populism or communitarianism, either one, address a different issue from liberalism. They address the issue of life together in direct relationships, in communities, in most of what we value most in our social lives. Liberalism addresses, crucially, the extent to which we can have some degree of fairness and protection of individual rights in relation to the large scale systems, including the state, which we always focus on, but in fact, we ought to look at the others as well. As a disposition, populism is, at least very often, a rebellion of life world against system. The populist crowd though, is too readily biased 
right? It imagines that it's the whole country is full of people who look like the people in the crowd. It misunderstands the larger issues of representation that would require abstraction and looking from a different viewpoint. It's vulnerable to demagogues. It's angry. But liberalism, right, is too easily harnessed to mere management of systemic imperatives. And here I mean management, not leadership, back to the question that Alessandro posed in the previous session. There is, in fact, a widespread idea of management of issues rather than leading us beyond some of the divisions that those issues structure. And I think here leadership isn't only management. And I know that Alessandro was pointing to a particular literature that connects these. But in fact, part of our issue is that liberal elites, so-called, governing um, political classes of different parties have undertaken to manage systemic imperatives. We have to keep the markets working. We have to keep the GNP up. We have to compete with other countries. There is no alternative in Margaret Thatcher's phrase. This is not just the committee um, of the bourgeoisie to manage its affairs in Marx's sense. It's also managing all of that very large scale connection and integration. But right, it can be calm rather than angry so long as its material interests are protected. And here I think what we see for 50 years is liberal elites being relatively calm while the lives of what we call populists are being radically disrupted. The populists become angry with that disruption. The liberal elites are focused on managing an overall system and willing to look the other way from that, partly because they aren't suffering individually. On the contrary, they may even be benefiting. Their home values are going up while others can't buy a house. Now this is more, I want to suggest, than just passions and sentiment versus reason and interest. It's more than the universal in particular. It involves distinct normative principles. Going back to the French Revolution, we should recall liberté, égalité, fraternité gets recalled in this 1968 poster, right? So this is a living tradition of principles. But political theory, including especially in the liberalism, communitarianism debates, tends to botch this, right? Tends not to get it well integrated as a triad. We tend to have a lot of politics that imagine, a lot of liberal politics, imagines the whole story is liberty and how much, inequal, how much inequality we tolerate, how much equality we achieve. How do we balance liberty and equality? And forgets the social solidarity questions. But these are basic. This is not just the value of we ought to like each other. We ought to live together in a friendly way. This is the basic question. Why should we be together as a society and as a polity? And indeed, are we really together? Because part of what the last years of populist antagonisms and the COVID pandemic now point to is the extent to which we are not together. I would say one of the most basic features of the United States today is that it is ceasing to be a country. It is divided so extremely on lines of region and geography, class, race, and other dimensions that Americans don't have a sense of a common experience of being in it together. And you get these bizarre moments um, within days of each other of um, white militants marching on the Michigan legislature, carrying AK-47s and other automatic weapons to try to intimidate the elected officials. And then the policemen killing young black men and the path into the disturbances in Minneapolis um, or in Midland, Texas or elsewhere. This question of whether or not we are a common polity is a crucial question alongside whether we are achieving equality in that polity and whether we are protecting liberty 
in that polity. This is behind the communitarian concern with rootedness and thicker forms of belonging. I actually think that's not a terribly great path into this issue that we, because it tends to pull us back to the image of that village community or of family. We tend to imagine belonging too much in that mode when we talk about thicker forms of belonging, but that's the language we have. I want to stress though, it's not just the communitarian concern with thicker belonging that brings this up, it's the liberal concern with inclusion. Are we adequately bringing immigrants into our polity? Are we doing well to connect minorities? So it's not that liberals don't care about inclusion, but that they have in many ways neglected the institutional bases for solidarity. So in both practical politics and political theory, I want to argue, there should be a kind of complementarity here where there is mostly conflict, at least if you believe the professional journals. There was a time, everybody will remember, a generation ago when the Journal of Political Theory was essentially a journal of liberalism and communitarianism arguing with each other, displacing all sorts of other debates. Well, too much got displaced. Cosmopolitan liberalism, which was sort of the winner of the debate with communitarianism, was not accompanied by national solidarity. Over these decades, when it has been celebrated theoretically, we have seen deindustrialization, destruction of local communities, a growing divide between metropolitan centers and the rest of their countries, the rise of a placeless logistical economy, right? The closing of shops, the closing of local facilities in favor of, of warehouses, the actual eradication of local communities so that people feel they have no place even if they have a job working in Amazon's warehouse, right? The opiate epidemic, financialization and debt, the extraordinary spread of consumer debt in the world, and poverty for working people, right? The shocking extent to which homeless people in a city like Los Angeles, where there are tens of thousands of them, have jobs. They're living in their cars. They're working. They can't afford rent the hollowing out of the middle class, the weak opportunities for the next generation. All of this happened in effect on the watch of cosmopolitan liberalism. Now, of course, the cosmopolitans didn't want any of these things, right? But the kind of globalization that was advanced, the capitalist finance dread globalization of the last 40 years, right? Um, revealed the contradiction in liberalism between its economic and political dimensions and revealed the neglect, not the will. Liberals didn't will these things to happen, but they didn't respond to them adequately. Not enough was done to make sure that the people who suffered deindustrialization in the richer countries were well integrated into a new social future. Right? Now, all this had been growing since the crisis of organized capitalism at the end of the 60s, the breakup of the post-war boom. All of these things were exacerbated by neoliberalism, which still is a variant of liberalism. And all were obscured for a, these liberal elites that I'm kind of hypostatizing here, partly because they believed in meritocracy. They believed that going to university, getting credentials, um, succeeding in examinations was an indication of merit and that merit meant justice. The whole term meritocracy has an ironic history that I wish I could elaborate from its creation in a dystopian vision by the great uh, British socialist, Michael Young, Right, the creator of the Open University, who said the failure, the disaster of the Labour Party would be its investment in the idea of meritocracy, thinking that it was undoing aristocracy and therefore achieving justice, it would create a new class of people who had succeeded on the basis of examinations who therefore thought they ought to have power and therefore thought others ought not, and a new resentment from the people excluded. Now, we could go back to higher education and note the inequalities built into the system. 
Note the extent to which the most prestigious and the least prestigious universities offer radically different life chances while they give the nominally same degrees. And see the extent to which meritocracy has been embedded in intensified social hierarchy. We could see it in its consumerist version in the neoliberal era. If you ever read the Financial Times, you will know its section that comes on how to spend it, right? Telling you about those things that you can buy if you have a lot of wealth. Because of the exaggerated hierarchy, the distance that is introduced and the many levels of this distance. But we say, that's them, that's financiers. What about us? Well, we have done the same thing in the world of universities by prioritizing prestige hierarchy over access and participation. Social cohesion demands shared futures, not closed factories, not boarded up main streets, not the radical increase in the income of the top 1% compared to the rest, not children who have little chance of earning more than their parents. The best estimates for the 1990 figure, if you were extending the graph at the bottom, is about 35%, right? So a dream of children doing better than their parents, which was often realized in the post-war boom years, is less and less realized. Yet democracy makes a strong promise. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people, in one phrase. Populism responds to the sense that this has been betrayed or that it was fake in the beginning. They never really meant it. It imagines government that is distant and run by elites who aren't like us and don't care about people like us. And it, this is exacerbated by the extent to which government is bureaucracy, not just democracy. But it can't be just democracy, right? Scale makes representative rather than direct democracy necessary and puts the representatives in the position of managing bureaucracies, not just exemplifying relations with their constituents. Democracy depends on social foundations, right? And it degenerates when we lose these social foundations. I'm not going, because I'm going to run too long if I do, to go into all of these different things. This is partly a matter of social solidarity. It's partly a matter of the foundations for public discourse and dialogue, right? And it's the, man, importantly, the foundations for feeling empowered in one's own life. Can you get things done? Can you get your children health care when they need it? Can you get your elderly parents into the healthcare they need in the context of the COVID pandemic and think of this in a whole other. Deep divisions in experience and life chances are anathema to democracy because they are anathema to the sufficiency of social cohesion to be the people of democratic self-rule. And this can be, as I've said, class or race or region or other deep divisions in experience and life chances. These are not just differences of ideology, but of material conditions. Response to the COVID pandemic is exacerbating many of these trends. It exposes and reinforces inequality. It ought to make us see, and I think it has to some extent made us see, issues of scale which we were ignoring. Long supply chains, for example, recognizing how much business in any one locality depended on its ties globally. Right? Systemic connections in that sense, place versus space, seeing the difference between these metatopical spaces we're in and concrete places. The role of indirect social relations, the importance of social cohesion. So we need both liberalism and communitarianism, but we also need more. If liberalism is too individualistic, Communitarian visions are apt to be too reliant on images of inherited community. We need attention to how the social fabric of any country is woven together or unraveled, right? This requires us to pay attention to institutions, intermediate associations, and social movements, because these are the ways in which we choose our future. 
if democracy is about choosing the way we will live together, then it is about institutions, intermediate associations, and social movements. It is not only about stressing the universal over the particular. It is not only about formal arrangements for participation in the political process. It is about these conditions of social solidarity. And it must be, or it will fail. In short, we need to achieve social connection despite physical distance and despite the social distances of inequality and disregard. Thanks. I need to undo sharing here somehow. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Um, okay, we have about 10 minutes uh, for, um, for questions. We have a couple already in the chat room, if I can find them here. Um, uh, Dr. Nasser uh, asks, how can, you ca how can you comment on linking the idea of Habermas's life world and system to the discovery of an antidote toward uh, COVID-19? The issue of the vaccine has raised many questions based on moral and ethical grounds. In the US, criticisms have been raised uh, on Fucci and Bill Gates, I'm at Tony Fucci, uh, and the Bill Gates Foundation towards this end. How can we address the fears and apprehensions toward the necessity of the vaccine? Okay, I'll be really quick with this. It's a big question and it's really important, but the short answer is, we need systems, institutions, experts to do that. We devalue these. We come in a moment of deep distrust. And so part of the danger of this deep distrust is that people refuse to wear masks. They refuse to wash their hands. They, it's politicized. We have a political division over the most basic health care, over whether to listen to health care authorities. And the institutional damage is real. In the United States, the Centers for Disease Control was a highly respected, highly effective institution built up over decades um, by effective professionals. The Trump administration has all but destroyed it. There are 700 unfilled senior positions in the Centers for Disease Control before the pandemic started. It has become literally less competent as well as politically discredited um, and run by political ideologues rather than experts um, in many cases. So um, that's just one example. Now, that means that whether it is a private corporation or public uh, institutions that play the biggest role in developing a vaccine, we face the problem uh, that the anti-vaccine movements already revealed of a distrust, a difficulty using the vaccine, a difficulty achieving the positive effects that it can bring. We want that silver bullet, but we are also suspicious. We, the larger polity in varying degree. And so I worry that we will have a vaccine that we won't be able to distribute and that people will reject, many people, and that this will, instead of providing a path out of the pandemic, will provide the basis for it to become recurrent and repeated and continuing. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Lawrence has a question. Thank you uh, very much uh, for this very stimulating talk. I would like to hear a bit more what you have to say about um, your confidence in and the potential of a role for parliament for national assemblies. That is, after all, um, one of the main achievements of, uh, of modern democracy. And I wonder whether you're not giving up too quickly on it. Um, and, and, and related to that, um, what faith do you have in the ability of political parties to regenerate themselves? Because after all, what you're describing when you talk about deep divisions reminds me much of what um, Stan Rokan and, and Martin Lipset wrote about with regard to the, the deep cleavages that divided these, these Western democracies uh, in this interwar period and that were reproduced somewhat usefully in, uh, in, a, in a working uh, system of political factions 
operating uh, through Parliament. Right. Um, great question. So first, uh, Lipset and Rokan were not all wrong, um, but um, time moves on. And what has happened between when they wrote and now is a virtual um, collapse, at least a deep breaking of the party system. And I don't mean just in the US, I mean in most of the so-called advanced democracies uh, or established democracies. Um, and even in India, um, the world's largest democracy, not always listed in this group, but where party has become um, deeply problematic. Um, I think party is broken as a mechanism for um, making legislator, legislatures effective um, and making citizen choice effective in modern democracy. So legislators become stuck or they become publicistic figures who are trying to get media attention and reach wider people. They're money raisers, they're various things. Um, but the mechanism that links citizen choice into the legislature is deeply damaged and um, would have to be repaired. I think that it's also the case in many cases, I know some better than others, that there has been a considerable centralization so it's not just that we have the achievement of parliaments, but we have moved more and more decision-making there. I know Britain relatively well in this case, um, but it's true of the US, it's true of elsewhere. Um, Britain has become radically centralized. British people like to say, oh, those French, it's so centralized, it's so etatist. Britain is more etatist than France. You can't have a local coalition decide to build public housing in Huddersfield without going to Westminster and getting authorization from the national government. Local government has been deeply eroded and damaged, has weakened authorities, weakened participatory structures. There never was an equivalent to state government in Britain. Um, so part of the problem is that too much is displaced into the national governments. Um, but there are also problems with parties and with how the legislatures themselves work. But in closing, I don't give up. I think legislatures are basic. I said representative democracy, we don't have a choice. We can't go to direct democracy. Populism is partly the illusion that we could go to direct democracy. Um, and if you have direct, to the extent you have direct democracy, you don't have liberal democracy. You don't have protections for the rule of law. You don't have uh, protections for rights. Um, so a representative system is needed. I just think ours is not working very well. We have one other question. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Jose is trying um, to raise his hand. David Cleary. It is, oh, oh is he? Mm -hmm. Well, in the meantime, uh, uh, let's hear Jose's question. Jose? Uh, thanks, Craig, uh, for this uh, uh, sociological lecture. I appreciate it very much. Um, obviously, yes, I fully agree with you. It's a question of um, scaling up. And uh, the fundamental question is, our social division of labor today is global. You mentioned corporations, obviously, the financial markets. The political international neoliberalism is based precisely on elite, whether the United Nations, G7, G20. It is precise. So my question is, I don't want to substitute the regional for the local, the national for the regional, uh, the transnational for the national, the global for the transnational. But we need to scale up. And it is at the level precisely of the kind of structures, intermediate structures, institutions, social movements of transnational solidarity which ultimately today will be the ones that can really deal with issues of global inequality and, and that basically we, we must think about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the need to recreate national solidarity, but not at the expense or we have to think equally for uh, scaling up all these questions of uh, equality and solidarity at the transnational level. And so I'm just, uh, I think the problem is a global civil society because it, we have structures of uh, international representation at the level of elites. We have obviously very clearly transnational economic structures, corporations, financial markets, but we don't have really institutionalized structures of global civil society where social movements could work. I'm not thinking in terms necessarily of a parliament, 
but certainly we need a networks of representation and of uh, um, uh, solidarity that go beyond precisely the mediation of international elites and cosmopolitan elites. So I, I don't disagree at all, Jose, that we need this. I do caution against throwing away the nation state when well, we I'm don't not. have that global solidarity. I'm not saying you're saying this, but this is what has worried me about a variety of articulations of cosmopolitanism, that I'm they want to go directly anything, to though. the global. Um, and I think um, this is um, at, at the very least premature, but in fact, we need all the scales. So I, it's not that I want to say, oh, let's be nationalists, that will solve all of our problems. It's that, one of the basic problems is this failure of national solidarity. And so that's bad internal. That's also partially responsible for the undermining of global cooperation. Um, so the failure of national solidarity has a global effect. It produces, say, Trump um, cutting the funding to the World Health Organization and things like that. So um, in regard to transnational solidarity, I, you know, I very much agree we need to build this. Um, and um, I, I focus elsewhere a lot on that. Um, what I would stress is we need to imagine it in ways that recognize the importance of nations and states, not just nation states, not just the hyphen, nations and states, to achieving transnational solidarity. Transnational solidarity can be a matter of the World Social Forum and um, uh, the um, Elite, World Economic Forum and Elites, World Social Forum and non-elites somehow directly, but this is not democracy, right? Where's the vote, right? When the um, humanitarian sector is full of organizations that do good things, but they're not democratic. Um, you don't have a vote in Greenpeace. You don't have a vote in Médecins Sans Frontières, even if you give money. Um, the, right? So we need to recognize the limits of democracy in actually existing international organizations, including movement organizations on the left, right? And we need to try to build that. So I agree, build global civil society, but build it in that way. In addition to the kind of solidaristic side though, there's simple state cooperation. A lot of um, what's needed globally, say in regard to the pandemic, is actually straightforward state cooperation on the basis of reasonable understandings of interests. Um, it doesn't require a sentiment of solidarity to say things like, um, we need to have um, a better um, uh, system for tracking uh, the virus in some sense. Um, so, you know, I don't disagree, but there is an, an emphasis that I want to place on achieving- Would, would you agree that this, why, that this is why the principle of subsidiarity is so necessary sure. to think of the different levels of scale? I very much agree with the principle of subsidiarity. I go back you know, in thinking about this, I think one dimension is to be appropriately scaled, yes. um, scaled to the level of the problem and its effects. Yes. Okay? Um, another dimension is to be appropriately structured. That is what kind of institutional form is being created? Will it be more democratic or less democratic, more elitist, less elitist and so forth? That's not entirely a question of scale, right? So there, there are two different issues to be asked about these organizations. And a third thing is we're talking not only about institutions, but if you will, about publics and um, um, how to think about public engagement, which means engagement beyond community, beyond those who feel the same as each other. With that will have to be the last question. Thank you, Greg, for a very stimulating paper and for uh, a really fascinating discussion. Um, I think uh, we're, we're running about, about 15 minutes to behind. Say something here. Thanks again to, oh, okay. Giancarlo, do you want to say something? Yes, yes, if, if we have time, just was I guess not. A short, so, oh, question. Oh, if, oh if I thought they, it was an organizational matter. <laughs> it was a great presentation, that one. Okay, of, I did too. Uh, yeah, we go. It was a great presentation and uh, focus on. Are, the issue. Did, okay, fine. Fine, I'm going. 
uh, uh, the, the presentation was focused on I the I turn land. it over to you, Giancarlo. Was based on the center of the presentation that I appreciated so much was the issue of the lack of uh, solidarity and fraternity in the liberal uh, uh, policies, in the policies of liberalism. The issue, the big issue for all of us is why liberal politicians forgot that. This is a very difficult answer, not easy, because they are bad people. Why everywhere they forgot that? Why they forgot that in the Britain and the United States and in India? Why they failed in Europe? Uh, not because they are bad people, but because they they depended. Because the, 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 all of us, all, uh, all, all politics depend on the race of the economic growth. The economic growth uh, needs to be fast. To take people out of poverty, you need economic growth. To have more economic growth, you need to care about the speed of economy. And the speed of, of economy depends on many factors. So to introduce there the solidarity and fraternity uh, could, could produce the opposite result. This is the very narrow passage where we have all politicians have to pass. So uh, I agree completely about the issue of meritocracy, uh, the, the um, critical analysis of, of the ideology of meritocracy, the way exactly the way Craig put it, uh, uh, Michael Young was fighting for uh, avoiding that that the should uh, that this medical the, the meritocratic system uh, would uh, have become a, a kind of new aristocracy, uh, but uh, uh, we should uh, we should focus on how difficult it is to produce economic growth uh, um, by uh, taking care uh, so much of. Uh, um, solidarity and fraternity, because uh, all those issues on pursuing social uh, uh, goals um, is not easy if you have to uh, let the race of the economy go on, because uh, that is something that from from which all politicians depend. That's. I'll be really fast, David, because I know you're trying to get at the conclusion. Um, I agree, Giancarlo. I think that the a contradiction at the heart of liberalism is accepting capitalism and then saying you value um, other things that are at odds with capitalism. So the, the coexistence within liberalism of not just neoliberalism, but the whole property version of liberalism and the political rights version of liberalism is a contradiction that's not worked out. So, um, and it, and democracy is at the mercy of its relationship with capitalism. Um, that was harnessed in some ways in the era of so-called organized capitalism um, in the 50s and 60s, um, but with some still very serious problems, the harnessing has fallen apart in the neoliberal era. And, politicians react, as you say, with the idea there's no alternative. I have to make the economy work. I'm only in office for two years or four years. I have all these limits. So all of that is true. Um, and liberalism is very weak because the whole constitution of liberalism is based on accepting the economy as a separate value sphere rather than directly engaging in transforming it. Um, and so that's an issue. Um, communitarianism doesn't adequately speak to this because it stays too stuck with the small scale decentralized local community. I'm in favor of actually more decentralization of more local community, but it will never solve these problems at large scale. So communitarianism doesn't give us enough when it tries to push us towards more solidarity. Um, and uh, so, so I agree, it's very hard for any individual politicians to do this. We're talking about a social transformation. If we cannot bring about a social transformation that is positive, we're going to have a disastrous set of social transformations. They're already underway. And I'll close off by, I can't resist a further note on meritocracy. So 
Michael Young was um, worried that this would end inclusion and would create all these problems. His book on meritocracy, in which he coined the word, ends with a rebellion um, of the people who have been excluded. Um, Tony Blair, to Young's huge chagrin, embraced meritocracy explicitly. He said the policy of the Labor Party must be meritocracy. And he made the Labor Party into a party of elite urban professionals instead of workers. And so a very significant part of Brexit and so-called populism and all of this is in fact a direct result of embracing an image of meritocracy against an image of solidarity against local community, against the workers and the trade unions, right? Um, and inscribing this into elite. Blair had a choice about that. That was not simply the necessity of managing the economy. That was a political choice and an unfortunate political choice. Okay. Finally then, uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Craig. Um, and uh, we have to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you again, Raman. And uh, uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, Sophia, want to say something about the break? How long? Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask uh, Professor Anderson and Professor Kaviraj if it was okay if we took a five minute break, if they were all right with that. I know we've already had a good time. Find a few sit up time. Okay, let's say we, we see each other in five minutes back. Okay. Five minutes, yeah. Perfect.
So I think we will be returning now if uh, Lisa, yes, you're right there, brilliant. So I'll just give a moment for, for folks to return and um, for Sophia to unshare that screen. Brilliant. So welcome back, everyone. Um, I can't believe that we have uh, arrived at our second to last uh, session of uh, the, this year's Venice seminars. I want to thank everyone for having been such fantastic sports throughout this whole um, experience. It is a completely new one for Reset Dialogues. We, we have uh, only had Zoom meetings amongst ourselves before, and, um, and it's been a real a real pleasure um, and educational experience. So, so thank you all, um, truly. Uh, so for our, uh, oh, I did want to mention one, one, one thing, which I hope we can, uh, you know, as many of, of us follow up on next year in person, um, which is uh, the, the annual uh, the tradition that we had established of visiting uh, somewhat presciently uh, or ominously the uh, Lazzaretto Nuovo uh, in Venice. Uh, which is, of course, one of the islands that was used uh, to prevent the spread of contagion of various plagues in the 16th century and then uh, onwards. And I think we had no idea when we went to picnic on this abandoned uh, island that uh, has now just the, the, the structure of, of where the, 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 the goods and, and people would be decontaminated for months, uh, that this would soon reflect our own uh, our own experience in in the real world, but I I know that we it will have a, a different meeting for us the next time we we meet there, um, and and anyway I look forward to to seeing as many of you um, as possible there uh, uh, next year. Uh, the uh, two speakers whom we have and whom we'll take in turn today, um, I will um, uh, I'm I'm very pleased and 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 glad that that they are here. Uh, we have uh, first uh, in, in, we'll go in order of, of the alphabet, um, Lisa Anderson, whom, as you know, is um, one of the, the directors of Reset Dialogues uh, in the US. Uh, she is our president pro tem, uh, but mostly you know her as a specialist on the Middle East and North Africa, as the former Dean of the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University, as a former provost and president of the American University of Cairo, uh, a, a former professor of government at Harvard University, a past president of the Middle East Studies Association, and a past chair of the board of the Social Science Research Council. Um, we are uh, thrilled uh, to hear from you today, Lisa, uh, and welcome again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, and uh, the title of um, the talk is community and individuals as, excuse me, community and individual as solace and escape. Please, Lisa. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be with all of you. Although as Craig pointed out, we are only sort of with each other. Um, nonetheless, the talk is um, actually the beginning of the talk title is under duress. And I wanted to explore a little bit um, the implications of some of the developments in the Middle East over the last 50 years um, for how we think about um, the dynamics of attachment to community or individualism. Um, so let me start with some general observations born in part of the thoughts that occurred to me as I was listening to other people over the last few days. Typically, we see the egoism of the individual against the loyalty to a community. The liberalism of human rights privileging the individual above all seems to contradict various forms of communal cohesion, from the solace of the religious and national communities to the stimulus of class solidarity. Equally typically, we assume that one or the other, the individual or the community, is the bedrock of human identity, 
and that the collection of traits attributed to each is both stylized, that is to say we can describe them, and stable. Um, I can borrow the useful formulation of Seligman and Montgomery um, in the paper that was associated with the conference. They say, on the one hand, we have the idea of the public order as articulated by proponents of liberalism and a politics of rights as secular, predicated on the idea of the morally autonomous individual and oriented toward the preservation of different sets of individual rights rather than the realization of an idea of the good. However, and at the same time they continue, more and more communities in both the United States and Europe are made up of individuals who do not understand themselves to be morally autonomous, but rather see themselves as enacting different sets of God-given commandments in the best of cases. <clears throat> excuse me, and of racially charged imperatives in the worst of cases, and who have very clear ideas of a public good that runs counter to the legal recognition <coughs> and assurance of individual rights. The result, they say, is the establishment of two competing arenas of social interaction, <coughs> expectations, mutuality, identity, and commitment. Now, obviously, the Middle East and North Africa is a region in which communal solidarities are conspicuous socially <coughs> and important politically. This is not more and more true, as Seligman and Montgomery say is true of the case in Europe, <coughs> so much as it seems to be perennial. The myriad expressions of, of the community of the faithful in Islam from the Islamic Republic of Iran to the Saudi King's role as the custodian of the two holy mosques to the Muslim Brotherhood or Al-Qaeda or ISIS, the continuing debates about Israel's status as a Jewish state, the political mobilization of Kurds in Iraq or Alawis in Syria and so forth and so on, all attest to the importance of communal identity. Yet in the Middle East and North Africa, we also see a region in which contestation over individual rights has been indeed perhaps more and more visible. Most recently in the uprisings of 2011 and thereafter, the calls for bread, freedom, dignity, and social justice were demands for human rights, the rights of all citizens, not members of particular or particularistic communities. How can this apparent claims making on the basis of both universal in, universalistic individual rights and particularistic community identities be reconciled? And what might that tell us about the trends that Seligman and Montgomery identify in the United States and Europe, in which more and more communities are made up of individuals who do not understand themselves to be morally autonomous, but rather see themselves as enacting different sets of God-given commandments. Well, first, let me make what I think is a simple, um, but perhaps not completely uncontroversial point. Uh, the bases of identity and connection are malleable and fluid. It is clearly a mistake, in my view, to construct a single political or social identity as if each of them were mutually exclusive and stable over time and space. If quantum mechanics tells us that objects have characteristics of both particles and waves, we might consider treating human beings as both statistics, individual data, votes, and souls, reflections of vast, perhaps infinite communities. Moreover, if there are limits to how accurately we can predict the value of a physical quantity before we measure it, also from quantum mechanics, perhaps we should take care in assigning labels to what might be transient selves. Identities and attachment are not fixed. If we wish to understand, not to say encourage opting for one or another kind, as if, as liberals say, we prefer individual autonomy over communal solidarity, for example. We need to know about the conditions in which such determinations are made and remade. So I'd like to argue that identity formation is shaped by duress. Evidence for this proposition is hardly unique to the Middle East and North Africa. John Donne's famous declaration of his connection to the rest of humankind, for example, no man is an island entire to itself, was written when Donne was recovering from an illness, probably typhus, from which he nearly died. The experience of being deathly sick when he was unable to care for himself moved him to recognize and acknowledge the extent of his debt to and embeddedness in a larger community. By contrast, a century and a half later, 
Kant decried dependence on others and celebrated individual autonomy, famously urging the courage to use one's own mind without another's guidance and characterizing the reluctance to do so as a reflection of fear. As he put it, if I have a book which provides meaning for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a doctor who will judge my diet for me, and so on, then I do not need to exert myself. The guardians who have kindly undertaken the supervision will see to it that by far the largest part of mankind should consider the step not only as difficult, but very dangerous. Kant's voice, I will argue, was the voice of a healthy, prosperous, the leisured, those who in, can enjoy the pursuit of happiness without distraction. He flatters himself that his fellows, and we flatter ourselves, that our fellows enjoy the same circumstances. But of course, not everyone is sick, nor is everyone healthy. And a few of us are, need, are, and few of us are either at all times. In contrasting Dunn and Kant's predispositions to favor what we might call a communitarian versus an individualist ethos, at least while writing these texts, I want to suggest that our circumstances, uh, how much we value our community ties and our individual autonomy. Stephen Macedo's talk earlier this week highlighted the difference between Tony Blair's liberal and elitist language of opportunity and promise with the terms used to describe the outlook of Trump supporting communitarians, more often alienated, resentful, and left behind. And Craig also referred to that just now. There's ample evidence in the Middle East and North Africa that duress contributes to the apparently heightened attachments to community. In an age of increasing inequality, class shapes attachment to liberalism here as everywhere. The fluctuation between community and individual is a reflection of hopes and fears, opportunities and constraints. I will not rehearse the communitarian antecedents, the communities of the faithful that are available in the Middle East and North Africa. I believe George Allard touched on that yesterday anyway. Suffice it to nod to the sometimes violent debates about citizenship, equal rights of all citizens regardless of religious community that attended the introduction of European style constitutions in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Although Islam was deemed the religion of the state in the Ottoman constitution of 1876, for example, it also affirmed the equality of all Ottoman subjects, including their right to serve in the newly elected legislature. And across the realm, religious leaders objected that this was an affront to God's law in the Sharia. So the battle lines about where law comes from were drawn 150 years ago. The period of direct rule in the region, particularly the mandate period between the world wars, did not do much to lend credibility to liberal conceptions of identity. European rulers were among the most enthusiastic manipulators of communica communitarian criteria in assigning political access and advantage. Again, I won't rehearse this. Just think of the Jewish homeland in Palestine and the design of Lebanon as a to create a Christian plurality in an independent state. Thus, by independence after the Second World War, both liberal and communitarian identities had become unmoored with the time-honored associations of Western or local traditions. For Middle Easterners, the West was often linked with promoting communitarian identities, while universalist liberal values often reflected a local attachment to citizenship in newly created states. By the turn of the century, that is to say, as we come into this century, however, the erosion of these egalitarian states began to show and the effects were increasingly apparent. That is to say, the local attachment to citizenship was becoming less and less valuable. The poverty rate in Egypt doubled from about a third between, between 2000 and 2018 to about two thirds. By 2018, in 10 Arab states, 41% of the population were classified as poor and additional quarter vulnerable to poverty. That is to say, two thirds of the population was living precariously. As Rami Khoury observed, quote, this trend seems to be directly associated with the steady recent decline in the quality of state managed basic social services including healthcare, education, water, electricity, transport, and social safety nets. And this was of course beginning long before the upheavals that attended the 2011 
uprisings. The very wealthy in the Middle East are a trans-regional, if not global class, whose money moves in and out of, as well as around the region, very freely, if somewhat opaquely. Thanks to the geography of oil ownership and the transformation of oil revenues into permanent financial endowments, as well it should, as it should be said to the retreat uh, from welfare state policies that, that were in the 1950s and 60s, the source of the egalitarianism of the region at the urging of international financial institutions. By 1990, at least, a region once known for its relatively egalitarian distribution of income seemed to have become in the estimate of Piketty, Thomas Piketty and some of his collaborators, the most unequal region in the world. Across the region, the share of total income accruing to the top 10% of income earners was about two thirds in the Middle East. In Brazil and South Africa, two off countries often characterized by the most as the most unequal in the world, the percentages were about 50% with each. So the gaps here in social service provision in what people were not getting because the wealthy were not paying taxes, were filled by private sources, family networks, and charitable associations. As urban slums proliferated, charitable associations assumed welfare responsibilities while corruption ate away at public bureaucracy. And regimes, regimes saw their control and even their knowledge of their citizenry slip away. The political impact of this informal privatization of the state and its relations with its putative citizens was difficult to assess because most of the activity took place in informal economy in Egypt and elsewhere that depended on personal networks of family, friends, and associates and seemed to provide economic foundations for new or revived loyalties, identities, and communities. Hassan Salama put it this way in the book that George Awad referenced yesterday. Gangs, nepotism, nepotistic privatizations, trafficking and influence, tolerance of drugs, militia corruption, the so-called black or informal economy, and Paris status rackets have all been obstacles to democratization. But, he continues, these gangs are also the instruments of survival of groups marginalized by the state, as well as forces maintaining those states. The apparent growth of sectarian kinship and other communitarian identities is in this context easy to understand. Being Kurdish in Iraq, being a member of the Warfala tribe in Libya, a Shia in Lebanon, a member of the Saud family in the country named after that family, these are all protections, solace and comfort where the fortunes of individuals are difficult to imagine, much less pursue in the absence of stable state and secure effective states. The demands of the Arab uprisings were a call for the liberal rights of citizenship, perhaps the last call in our generation, and an effort to escape the bounds of communities that limit rights to privileges. Citizens, you should recall, have rights and responsibilities. Members of communities have obligations and privileges. The fact that these efforts to claim the rights of citizens were often a spectacular fail, failure boards bodes poorly for such rights everywhere, that inequality erodes states, both as sources of common secular public identities and as protectors of welfare. The Middle East is not as much of an exception, it seems to me, as we might hope. Moreover, keep in mind that the reliance on communitarian identities serves the purpose of the very wealthy. Let me remind you of Kant's observation that the guardians who have kindly undertaken the supervision will see to it that by far the largest part of mankind should, con should consider the step of using one's own mind as not only difficult, but very dangerous. Duress does not produce liberal individualism on the part of those applying it or those suffering it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for um, I think what is ultimately a somewhat pessimistic view <laughs> for the time being for a change. Um, I, I, I wonder, so when you think about European uh, history and the, the tor tortured and, and very um, roundabout manner in which uh, the, the European countries arrived at something like representative democracy, 
knowing that there was two steps forward, three steps back throughout the 19th century, that you had extensions of the suffrage and then contractions, um, uh, the, the, the permission for, for civil society reform and then it being taken away, the restoration of religious rule or dynasties and its abolition. There was so much back and forth, um, you know, just between 1848 and 1878. How do you, if you were to zoom out, how, how, how would you see, um, you know, where would you place the Middle East? <laughs> I know it's, a, it's an impossible question, but can, can, you, can you think of it in these terms of, of, of tortured progress? Um, I used to, but I don't anymore. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I don't. I mean, my concern is that both at a regional level and increasingly at a global scale, um, I think the, what I called the other day, the, you know, sort of Davos world um, is really corrosive for the communities that we think of as public state identities. So, if you look at the Middle East, and I think I can, what I'm doing is essentially a projecting this on to a global scale. Um, the behavior and interests of the top 1% or the top 10% in the Middle East um, is so inimical to anything like re democratic representation to state, um, resilience and so forth that I just cannot, and, and they have such a disproportionate amount of the resources of the people of the region. It's just very hard for me to imagine how that will ultimately change. And in the absence of that change, I just see people who are living very well, who know they're living very well, and who are beginning to demonize people who are in their own presumed political community. So here you really do see that what I was again talking about yesterday, the, the kind of contempt that the elite have for people who should be their co-citizens, who should have rights and so forth comparable to theirs. They are beginning to be characterized as really virtually certainly not citizens, hence you see the decline of citizenship. And you see this dramatically in the Gulf where the vast majority of people who live in the Gulf countries are not in fact citizens, but that you know, capacity to characterize the other as beyond some kind of potential for equality, even formal, they can vote, so forth and so on equality, just seems to me to be very difficult to reconcile with a, a optimistic sense that yes, of course, there's some backsliding and so forth. It is true that there's some backsliding and it is true that that was the case in Europe and there isn't any reason to think that sweetness and light prevails easily and so forth and so on. But I just, I don't see, it is a pessimistic view of the region. And what worries me is that I, I do see it not unique to the region. I do see this kind of, uh, you know, après moi approach to politics on the part of elites around the world. Thank you. I see, um, I recognize Jose Casanova followed by Craig Calhoun. Uh, yes, I, I, I hear we are, the story repeats itself and again and again locally, but at a global level. Namely, it is the same story story in the Middle East, in Latin America. And it seems to me also when we look for solutions, social democracy in one country is not possible for the reasons precisely that no social democratic country could compete with the other neoliberal capitalist countries. But populism in one country is not possible either. So only either global social democracy or global populism. Because obviously we knew the story of autark autarchic populism, of course, is the Peronist story that goes back from the 50s to today in Argentina. So ultimately, we are stuck together, either as social democrats or as populists. And we see how even today, right-wing populism also repeats its discourse globally. So it seems to me that we are stuck in this idea that 
we can solve these problems at the national level and we cannot, we cannot. I agree with that. I don't think we can. And I mean, again, yesterday when we were talking briefly about the problems of inequality, one of the questions which I thought was clever is what would life be like if we could make being a billionaire illegal? Well, that would be one, you know, that's an interesting idea, but it would have to be global because exactly. as we know, the billionaires are very good at moving their billions around. So unless we have a, a global scale to begin to think about what the impact of sovereign wealth funds and, you know, tax havens and, you know, kind of the behavior of billionaires, not, and that, that trivializes it in a way by making it about individuals. It's structural, but there is not a local or national level solution. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, Lisa. You have succeeded in making me pessimistic, but you didn't do it alone. You've had a lot of help. Um, I want to ask about something that would make me optimistic or a little bit more optimistic, though I don't see it, which is part of why I'm pessimistic. And that's movements. I don't mean waves of protest. I mean movements in a longer term, large scale conservative. So the way social democracy in many European countries was a movement over a hundred years. Um, it it you know, linked labor movements to other kinds of organizing and uh, uh, provided a, um, a level of cohesion through time as well as for its members at any one time. Um, and so in that sense, the long-term movement, um, nationalism and Islamism have been movements in some sense um, in the Middle East, um, Arab nationalism earlier and Islamism. Um, there was a labor movement. So you know, in Egypt, there really was a labor movement at one time, not much recently. <laughs> and um, do you see any sort of movement level organizing? And I see this as a global problem too, just as Jose says, it's not all national, but I see this as a both and, right? There's no global substitute for the national there's no national substitute for the global, um, but without concerted organizing, how can there be much change in this? Is there concerted organizing? Actually, what I'm sorry, Craig, I think I'm just gonna make you more pessimistic. Um, oh, one of the things that was really, <clears throat> is really a puzzle about the, uprisings and about Occupy Wall Street and some of the comparable uprisings, if you will, in other parts of the world, is the hostility, almost allergic reaction to developing institutions and to developing any kind of, you know, there's a real suspicion of institutions. So, you know, when people would say, well, who is going to be the leadership of this? You know, who is going to, are we, are you going to develop a political party? Are you, so absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, a quite explicit, no, this isn't how this is going to work. So of course, anyone who had an institution, anyone who, you know, it, and it didn't even have to be a military institution. Any institution is going to be able to trump for longevity. Good old Weber told us this the capacity, you know, these sort of uprisings. So these charismatic moments disappeared rather than the institutionalized. I can't figure out why there is that kind of hostility. I, I mean, in some ways, the lived experience of institutions in much of the world has been something of a disappointment, so okay. Um, but still, it's, it's seems to me it goes beyond that, um, that there is a something about the experience of everybody under 40 at least, that just they don't think that that kind of sustained capacity to organize um, is going to be valuable or important to them. And everybody over some age or other doesn't see how you're going to be able to sustain the capacity to organize without it. Um, so there's a, there's a, 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 a kind of historical moment. And that's different from, it seems to me, 19th century Europe, where everybody was going to be a political party, everybody, you know, and so forth and so on. Now, nobody wants to do that. 
So I have to say the thing that seems to be, you know, different about the world today is the media, um, you know, the technology, but I don't, I can't figure out why that would be having this consequence, but it does, it is pretty clear that everybody likes to have your let's get together in the square and then we're going to go home and then we're going online and then we're going to do something else. Um, and so, you know, the capacity to just get in the trenches and really fight is quite limited. So no, I don't see a movement developing. I see lots of little flash mobs all around the world for a very long time. Thank you. I have uh, two questions in the queue. Uh, the next will come from Volker Kahl. Okay, Lisa, thank you so much. It, it catches up a little bit with, with what you said also yesterday. So, so in a, a possible reading of populism is that they actually have a Marxist understanding of the state in the sense that the state represents only the interests of the ruling classes, right, of the elite, okay. Quest, two questions. First of all, would you share such a reading of the state in the Middle East and perhaps also beyond the Middle East? And if so, what could be a remedy? How could, I mean, how could we counter that in order to get more form, greater forms of solidarity and equality? Well, the answer to your first question is pretty obvious. Yes, I do share that. The states, whatever they were when they these countries became independent. And, and, you know, actually, I think there's room for some argument here. What did you think Egypt or Syria or Iraq or Algeria represented in the 1950s and 60s? Clearly, a lot of people thought this was going to be an opportunity to be a citizen, to be, you know, not only independent of European rule, but to actually be a citizen with an accountable government. Franz Fanon thought it was a fraud from the beginning. He thought the nationalists were going to, you know, take over for their own purposes and behave just like the Europeans, only local. Um, and certainly that is what happened, whether it was, you know, whether he saw things that people weren't seeing then or whether he was just prescient. What happened was the deployment of these state institutions as instruments for the purposes of the elite, whatever. How, however one wants to define that. I think um, actually Marx's characterization is pretty good. It is the executive committee of the bourgeoisie, but that's certainly the way it, it's operated now. It is not, you know, these state administrations and institutions are not designed to be serving a citizenry. That, so then, you know, that does lead you, I think, given the fact that people don't seem to be particularly interested in building counter institutions, um, kind of at a dead end, or at least it's hard to see one's way out of it um, because that does mean that the elite have all of the financial resources and the institutional capacity to stay where they are. So why shouldn't they? One can hardly fault them for saying, no, we figured it out and you didn't. Um, but I don't see the, the counter to that. I don't see where it is. I don't see a movement developing. I don't see people saying we have to get in for the long haul and build things that aren't, you know, the interesting thing about, well, anyway, I'll stop at that point. I don't see it. So we have uh, a question from David Rasmussen and then one more from the queue and then we will turn to our, our second speaker, Sudip Dekaviraj, but please, uh, David Rasmussen. Uh, Lisa, um, now I understand your reasons for, uh, for pessimism a couple of days ago. I didn't really understand them at that point, but uh, I guess this is a kind of devil's advocate question. Uh, uh, what about Tunisia and the constitutional developments in Tunisia? Don't they represent uh, uh, some kind of institutional uh, response to uh, developments in the Middle East? I, I am a Tunisia skeptic. Um, that, but I understand the question, and I, you know, if if you want to have, you know, I have opened Pandora's box, so let hope fly out too. And this is Tunisia. This is why people grasp onto Tunisia. Um, I, I, 
uh, and in part, my Tunisia skepticism is born of an earlier moment of enthusiasm when Ben Ali, who overthrew Bourguiba and became the kleptocrat of the, you know, region, was briefly um, appeared to be something of a liberal with a small L and did seem to be interested in an inclusive political system and had a national pact and brought everybody in except the Islamists and so forth. Um, and many of us were, including many Tunisians, Tunisians on the left and liberals, um, were quite taken in by that. Um, so once burned, twice shy, and I am certainly twice shy about the capacity of the Tunisians to sustain, particularly in the context of the economic challenges they are confronting now, um, to sustain the raucousness of democratic politics. Um, if they do, um, that will give us some sense of what kinds of things one might envision for other places. Um, it's the Tunisian state administrative capacity is relatively strong by the standards of the region and that probably bodes well. Um, and the size and wealth of the top 1% in Tunisia, that is to say how they throw their weight around, if you will, um, is relatively modest. Tunisia's income inequality is not as great as many of the other countries in the region. So those two things do suggest that they may have a shot. And if they do, then we will be able to say that part of the problem is income inequality. And if the international financial institutions don't care about that, they are also not caring about state capacity and or democracy. Thank you. And, and a, a final question from, from the, the chat, um, to which I would just add one one small addition. Um, is there, from Shalom uh, Korbman, uh, is there a role for demographic increase in the crisis of North Africa and the Middle East, more people, less resources? And I would add, what is the role of energy transition, more broadly speaking, um, in, in potentially freeing the region from certain constraints? So if, if, democracy, if democracy has been um, impeded, by uh, rentier states, um, what could the shift in in you know from phosphates to new energies do for 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 enabling other classes' interest to emerge and defend themselves institutionally? Um, both good questions. I think the population issue is has been important. Um, the strain. Um, on state capacity posed by pretty much untrammeled population growth across the region has been an exacerbating factor, not, I think, the only one. Um, and many of the big, big countries in the region sort of got away with not paying attention to it by exporting migrant labor um, and so sort of obscured the problem, but obviously wasn't solving it. Um, so I think population is important as a uh, contributing factor to the erosion of state capacity. Um, but we have the populations we have now. So even if one saw a, you know, a population transition tomorrow, which of course many of these governments are not encouraging, they want more people because somehow big seems powerful and better and so forth. Um, pretty astonishing when you think about it, but be that as it may. Uh, I don't think we'll see it soon. And even if we did, we still have populations that are gonna be very hard to um, support with the resources that are available in the region. So one of, to, that gets, that's a transition into this issue about oil and related natural resources. Um, the, Middle East and North Africa as a whole are agricultural importers. Um, these are all foodstuffs and so forth and so on that is paid for by these kinds of natural resource exports. Um, and the reason in part that they have to be agricultural ex importers, including Egypt, including Algeria and so forth is because one, they've let their agricultural sectors decline 
um, as part of the decline in state capacity, but they also have too many people. So that's going to be a challenge for a long time. And if climate change really has the impact that we think it's going to have, it's just going to be exacerbated. So this is not also a good picture. But to get back to this business about um, the basically oil revenues in Rentier State, one of the things that has escaped people's attention that I would like to draw uh, it back into is most of the oil exporting countries and many of the other countries in the region have developed sovereign wealth funds that permit them to draw revenues out of investments that are independent of any kind of export or import of any good. Um, and so the financialization of revenues um, in the world, I would argue, but certainly is quite visible here. The Kuwaitis invented this idea of a sovereign wealth fund um, many decades ago. And the Kuwait sovereign wealth fund is actually one of the few that is relatively transparent. Um, the Kuwaiti managers of the fund are supposed to report to the Kuwaiti um, parliament periodically and so forth and so on. All the rest of them are completely, completely opaque. And they are billions and billions of dollars. Um, and they're being managed by some of the biggest investment banks in the world. Um, so one of the challenges is going to be to say, okay, by the time oil runs out, to put it crudely, if I may, um, they're going to be so inserted into the world of high finance that they're gonna be coupon clipping forever. That's a very interesting move on the part of these regimes. Um, I don't think I would have been clever enough to figure it out myself, but boy, that is just, you know, so no, I don't say, I mean, yes, they're gonna talk a good line about the, you know, tran oil transition and so forth and so on because they should and because this transition to the sovereign wealth funds is not complete and so forth and so on. Um, but they're positioning themselves to be quite comfortable for a very long time. Well, thank you very much, Ruth Anderson. That was a truly fascinating, and and I will continue thinking about much of this, um, and as I'm sure we all will. Um, unfortunately, already have to turn to our our next speaker, um, which I must say is not unfortunate. So, Ripta, I hope that you can make us more optimistic about something. <laughs> Exactly. Let me introduce uh, Sadipta to the to the group. Um, Sadipta Kaviraj is a professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies uh, at Columbia University. Uh, he's a specialist in intellectual history. He's a specialist of Indian politics, uh, and in particular, he works on two fields of intellectual history: Indian social and political thought uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, and modern Indian literature and cultural production. Uh, he received his PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and uh, before joining Columbia, he taught at SOAS in London. Uh, his books include The Imaginary Institution of India, uh, Civil Society History and Possibilities, which was co-edited with Sunil Kinlani, and uh, The Unhappy Consciousness, uh, Bankim Chandra, Chado Pade, and the Formation of National Discourse in India. Today's talk is entitled, When Are We a Community? Please, Professor Kaviraj. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, cannot hear you yet. We cannot hear you. Uh, I have unmuted my mic. Ah, yes, maybe, could you turn up the volume of your microphone? Okay. In, in the settings. Yeah, I have turned it up. Uh, can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. Can you have to speak you... up. You have to speak up. I'm sorry. If you could maximize the input volume in your settings on Zoom uh, under the audio tab. Yeah, I've actually turned up the speakers as much as I can. Yes, now it's good. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to thank the speakers for uh, thank the organizers for organizing this conference, which I think is very timely, and also for an opportunity for me to take part in this. 
I found uh, the discussions absolutely fascinating. Um, what I shall do is uh, I'll divide my remarks into three parts. Uh, the first part would be <coughs> on mainly Western political thought, but um, a tradition which I think we have uh, not gone over very much in our discussions till now, which is the Hegel Marx tradition. I'll, I would like to note a few features of that and also something from Tony. And then I shall turn to um, two other questions. One is what is the individual and what is the community? Because I think um, my major worry <coughs> is that the political philosophical discussion about between libertarian in the individualist libertarians, uh, uh, liberals, and communitarians has been uncurious about uh, historical sociology. Uh, they have not actually pushed the question of what is an individual because the individual is not a given. Uh, it's a complex thing and it's further complicated because it changes over history. The possibilities of how, an how a person can be an individual is not something which is static in history in any society. And similarly, <clears throat> I think community is not just a single thing. There are many, many different ways in which uh, when people can say we, um, in some cases, it should be characterized as a community. In some other cases, it should be characterized as a collectivity, but not a community. So I would divide my remarks into these three parts. So the first part is, uh, what is the problem? I think the problem was seen quite <clears throat> clearly in Western political theory. Uh, Professor Walter in his opening remarks talked about the Hobbes Rousseau kind of tradition. I personally feel that one of the clearest expositions of what this problem is, at their time, it was still not a problem in the present, it was um, still a problem in the future. But I admired the way in which Hegel and Marx between the two of them Saw what the problem will be. And I think the best presentation of that in a sense is in the philosophy of rights in Hegel, that you have a sense of community in the family. But to go to uh, Craig's point, which I think is an absolutely vital point, but I also have a slight difference with Craig, which I think would come out in the course of the presentation. But the family cannot be scaled up. The nature of the belongingness that you have in the family <coughs> It has certain sociological features like face-to-faceness, uh, small scale, connection to uh, genealogy and things like that. These simply cannot be transferred across onto other groups of belonging, <coughs> particularly when you try to scale it up. I find the <coughs> section on civil society and particularly some of the phrasings in the system of need very, very interesting because it shows that with the rise of the capitalist economy, you would have two problems. One would be that the character of needs of people would change and the character of needs would be more and more material needs. And the needs that people have of belonging of a different kind would be affected by this and would probably be depleted by this. I think in Hegel, there's a very interesting suggestion, very short, but in the section on cooperation, there's also a very interesting suggestion that you know people, do not get totally divested of the uh, experience of community. Their community, experience of community is based on their work. So the postman actually lives his whole life as a postman and other postmen are their community in a certain sense. But I think there's no doubt if we read uh, philosophy of right and the chapter on alienation in, <clears throat> in economic philosophical manuscripts that they realize what the problem is. <clears throat> I think they also uh, offer a solution, which I think has historically turned out to be completely untrue. In Hegel's case, the solution is a state conceived as a nation, which actually gives you a community, but it's not a family-like community. There are two differences. One is obviously the difference of scale, but the point where I would like uh, us to think more with Craig, but push a bit further, is that it's not just a question of scale. It's a question of the character of the community, the principle of the community, which in the family sense cannot be scaled up, but in 
case of the state, I think Hegel believed that uh, that actually provides the community, that the expansion of economic capitalistic modernity would uh, deplete inevitably <coughs> in society. <clears throat> and I think in Marx, despite all his dissatisfaction with Hegel, I think Marx's uh, solution to this problem is completely Hegelian, because I think what he does is he realizes that the loss of community would be a very great uh, depletion, very great problem for human uh, civilization. But he thinks that the responsibility of creating the communal sense or supplying the community should be handed over to the state, which I think had been uh, the blind spot of the socialist tradition of all kinds, communist, socialist, etc. So we give over the task, we acknowledge on the one side that the great need for a community against the rise of the logic of capitalism, but we hand it over, I think, totally unthinkingly to the state. And if there's anything clear over the last history of the last 150 years, is that the state cannot last, in fact, bureaucracy cannot actually produce the community. So I think this is the problem. <coughs> and my other dissatisfaction with the communitarian liberal individualist debate is, as I said, that they, there's a lot of sophistication in the argumentation, but I think they take the individual and the community as static concepts. They simply do not try to unpack them and try to explore them, which is what I'll try to do. First, I've done that slightly in a paper, so I'll simply repeat that. What is the individual? <clears throat> what is the individual identity? I do not agree at all with the with an argument that we get in the work of our great uh, Indian economist, you know, Amartya Sen, who says that uh, every individual has multiple identities. I think it's a completely unpromising way of thinking. I think every individual has a specific identity. We should use the term identity uh, truculently in the singular, because my identity is what actually separates me off from everybody else in the world. The Buddhists will say, because they are great logicians, they would say that it also separates me off from what I was uh, 15 years back when I was a professor of, uh, in the London University and not yet in Columbia. So my identity today is also separated off, you know, logically, from what my identity was then. <clears throat> so my argument is that you know, sin is, of course, not wrong. Uh, my identity, what I call my identity, is composed of a contingent combination of attributes, like my being a man, my being a Bengali, my being an Indian, my being a professor, my being middle class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are not identities. These are identity attributes, which are put together to constitute the identity of an individual. <coughs> But we should also unpack the verb put together because putting together has two sides. Putting together has an individual side and putting together also has a social side. The individual side is that if you ask the question, uh, who are you? Does it mean who I think I am? Of course, it would be invidious to say that what I think I am doesn't play any role in my being who I am. Of course, you know that's a very important part of it. Uh, it's the first person side of identity. But identity also has a third person side or interactive side, because in many social settings, who I am or how I act in the world depends on how other people think I am, you know, what other people think I am. So I can get into a communal riot in India and I can protest to people that, you know, I'm not a Hindu, I'm not, uh, I'm not a believer, so how can I be a Hindu? But I can still be, uh, uh, I can still be lynched and killed. Uh, not when I'm a Hindu, but I'm a Muslim. If I'm a Muslim and I say that, well, I'm an irreligious person, so don't uh, take me for a Muslim simply because of my name. I can still be killed. So who I am, my individual identity, is not entirely in my hands. It is something which fluctuates, or it's something which is actually created by, again, a contingent uh, interaction between the things which are on controlled by me and things which are beyond my control. So the first person side and the third person side, this I'm borrowing the terminology from my colleague, 
and friend uh, Akhil Bindrami, he has a paper in which he discusses this. He, I want to introduce into that you know, second person element in the sense that if, um, of course, there are some things which are true of me because I think I am that. There are certain things which are true of me because average Americans think that I am uh, that kind of person. But I think the second person interaction is also very important. If I suddenly have a deeply racial experience, then my understanding of who I am and my understanding of the society in which I live and how that society treats me is also going to be changed, right? So I want to introduce into that a second person kind of element, an interactive element, not with the society as a whole, but somebody who accidentally comes to have a deep interaction with me. So I think that you know we need uh, a theory of the individual or individual identity, which is far more complex. And we should try to think about some of these questions uh, much more deeply. And uh, I believe that you know it also touches on something else which came up in our discussion sometimes. I sometimes say that you know these are like adjectives, my being a male, my being Bengali, my being Indian, these are like adjectives. But I always have a verb which is with me that, you know, I, uh, I fade some of these elements and I foreground some of these elements in the construction of who I am at this particular moment. So I am, uh, I have particular political views, but if tomorrow suddenly I change into a supporter of Hindu nationalism, <laughs> then, you know, what I'm doing is that an identity which is implicitly putatively in me because I come from a Hindu background, I'm suddenly sort of picking up from the faded background of my identity stock and pushing it to the front. And so the point of emphasizing the verb is that this is something which is not inert. You know, it's not inert in an individual sense. And of course, it's not inert and dynamic in the historical sense. And one uh, interesting point that can be derived from this is that this means that we can have ourselves two very different ways of relating to our identity. We can be identity pluralist, or we can be identity absolutist. You know, somebody who says that the most important thing about me is that I'm a Hindu, uh, then sometimes implies that he does not understand that he's anything else. But I think it's very unlikely that people do not understand that they are uh, other things. They understand that their teachers, their husbands, you know, their um, you know, they, they are, have a particular uh, occupation, but they are identity absolutized. So they have absolutized a particular element of their identity and stamped it on that verb. And I'm an identity pluralist. And the other thing from which we can now go into the discussion of communities is that many of these identity attributes are such that they are attached to communities or collectivities. So I can be a Muslim only if there's a community in the world historically, you know, which is not a singular individual, but a large community of people who characterize themselves as Muslim. And their, their characterization of their collectivity would have something to do with my characterization of my the meaning of my being a Muslim as an individual. So I think many of these identity attributes actually face into collectivities of different kinds. And I, my second suggestion is that you know, we can, if we want to take the debate forward from the 80s, 90s debate of um, liberals, liberalism and communitarianism, we should also give attention to this. So where do we find thick, or why do we, we find conceptually elaborated discussion about what a community is? What makes a collectivity a community? Under what conditions is a we? Uh, does a we deserve to be called a community? And you will see that the way I'm moving, you can immediately see that this immediately opens up the possibility that the we's can be communities, but communities can also be plural. The, the community of, of religion and the community of language, they're both communities in this sense, but they are different types of communities. And uh, I think in Tony's, uh, in a vague way, I think there is a kind of faint suggestion of this. So uh, we can go into that discussion as well. 
because for understandable reasons, I think Tony is much more interested in defining and exploring the Gesellschaft side. And there's a slight lumping of things, in my view, on the Gemeinschaft side. But the Gemeinschaft side also, I think, needs to be separated out, unpacked, and uh, we should seek the principles of the different types of communities. So where should we find theories of these? I think we shall find theories of these in two types of sources. First of all, if we turn to Western political theory, I think we would have a great stock of thinking about communities of very different kind. In Aristotelian thinking about the koinonia, there is an understanding of the community, but under specific historic conditions. This is what I greatly liked about Craig's presentation in the morning, that you know, it's very difficult to scale it up you know, from the kind of historical context in which Aristotle is thinking of the state or society, you know, the polis as a koinonia. We have the understanding of res publica, what is public in the Roman tradition, which goes through a certain transformation in the Republican tradition in Florence and things like that, the work of uh, Pocock and others. But notice again that when we go into that, you know, there's a problem of scale, which is also partly reflected in Rousseau, right? Now, so that is in the Western tradition. And uh, I think when we come into the modern period again, there are people who are thinking of, uh, particularly conservative thinkers, sometimes we do not like what they say politically, but sometimes in people like Demet or others, there is um, an attempt to think about what we are losing. And sometimes I think we should give some attention to that as well. But I think it would not be surprising to say that we should look for the meaning of what real community is among historical societies where community still exists. Community is not actually depleted by the rise of capitalism and capitalist individuation in the West. So I think there's a slight paradox in this that uh, uh, communitarians are essentially Western political thinkers who desire a community in a society where it's very difficult even to grasp uh, you know, vestigial senses of the convivial. For instance, when I was in Oxford, I was totally surprised in spite of me, my thinking coming from Marxism and things like that, that uh, on Christmas, you know, the place actually looked as if there was some kind of mourning. In fact, there was nobody on the street. There's the uh, feeling, you know, of uh, feeling of desolateness, you know, which is not what it should be. It, there should be uh, a time, you know, which is a feeling of festivity. Now, anyway, so what shall we get if we turn to the thinking of other societies? I'll give you one example. I think there are two types of things that we should explore. It's just very programmatic. I'm not giving you any content of anything, but I'm simply trying to map out uh, the, the kind of agenda which we should try to fulfill if we want to deepen this conversation. On the one side, I think we should interrogate the religious tradition, you know, the Judaic tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Christians, of course. Hindus, again, very interestingly, because Hindus do not have a common worship, right? They worship different types of God. But in a certain sense, they have a dual sense of community that I would have a strong affinity with people who worship the same God, if I'm a Vaishnavite. But I also do not, uh, I also feel that people who do not worship my God, you know, they are also part of my community in a certain sense. My grandmother, who was a Shakta, so for her, God was feminine and Shakti. But she also had, uh, she also worshipped the icon of, of Krishna and Radha in which a Vaishnavite icon. So I think we should give more attention to community creation in the religious tradition on the one side. I shall give you an example of something which I find very impressive in the Islamic tradition. Just one example. For instance, I uh, hear from some of my colleagues that when a Muslim, a true Muslim says in one of their traditions, when a true Muslim says that that man is poor, you know, that statement has two layers. One is an empirical layer of saying that then that person actually has less money, but it also has an ethical layer, which is always pinned, stapled to that empirical statement itself, that I need to do something to get him out of that kind of condition. I'm not saying that all Muslims think like that, or all Muslim traditions do, but I think if we try to understand what is the sense of community, 
I think we should look at some of those types of, you know, uh, the lines of thinking. Now I want to turn. Uh, Jonathan, how much time do I have? Five, six minutes? Okay. I want to turn to India now. And I want to make two basic points. I believe that what I find interesting in India, the tradition of Indian social thought, uh, India has had, I think, from the middle of the 19th century, from around 1840, you know, quite a highly developed and very sophisticated uh, form of engaging with the problem of modernity. Uh, some of it is not in English. Uh, some of these people are bilingual, like Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi writes in Gujarati and in English, but most of Gandhi's basic ideas you will get in, in English. But there are many other thinkers, I'll give you one example, who do not write in English at all. So the riches of their thought are essentially buried in a certain sense. It's a peculiar kind of secrecy that people who read Bengali, it's not secret to them, it's public to them, but it's secret to everybody else. So there's a lot of thinking about this in modern Indian thought. What is modernity? What is modernity doing to our economy? And what is modernity doing to our political life? And I shall give you, um, I have two arguments. The first argument is that we developed a tradition of thinking in the period of Indian struggle against uh, British colonial power which is a form of nationalism, which I would call anti-national nationalism. Uh, deliberately to provoke you, <laughs> what I mean by international nationalism is that they try to understand what is it that has given this kind of power to small European societies so that they can actually go around the rest of the world and uh, bring those societies under their stable control. And many of them think that it is not because of military power, it's not because of the economic power of capitalism. It is military power, economic power of capitalism mediated through something which they see as a kind of political organization of society, which they call nationalism. And where most of them realize that it is the power of a religious community which has been transposed onto the state because those societies are actually religiously homogenous. So, for them, I'm calling it anti-national nationalism because they have a certain conception, which I think is quite accurate about the nature of the European nation state and its homogeneity. They believe nationalism in India in the pre-independence period means two things. Nationalism means anti-colonialism that we should try to throw the British out, right? So the term nationalist is used for that and all these people are nationalists in the first sense. But the second meaning of the term nationalism is that the political community that we shall create in India, potentially after independence, should be like the European nation state, because that is the only possible form of political community under modern conditions. And most of the serious thinkers in the Indian tradition do not agree with that. They're deeply troubled by that. And I'll give you an example of one single thinker. His name is Bhudev Mukhopadhyay. He never wrote anything in English. So it's very difficult to get uh, his views. I have a paper on him. I can circulate that later on. But let me give you an example of what he argues. He says that um, our society is very diverse. He is a deeply Hindu conservative thinker. But he thinks very much like Gandhi. And you should also see in this that you know Gandhi is not Gandhi's thinking is not unprecedented. Uh, there's a lot of you know prior thinking which goes into Gandhi's thought. So he says that just as being Hindu is very important for me, I can understand that because they're Muslims who are my neighbors, <coughs> being Muslim is equally important for them. So the religious community is a great source of community feeling. It's a great source of belonging. And he thinks that it would be a disaster if that source of belonging is taken away from us through the rise of economic modernity and the imposition of a political modernity of a European-like nation state, which erases the religious communities, which is the liberal argument, which erases the uh, religious communities completely and leaves us only with the putative community of the liberal state of citizenship, right? Now, but he thinks that 
we need a political community. The political community cannot, the political community for Indians cannot be the community of Hindus or Muslims. Because if you make that either Muslim or Hindu, then you cannot live with the other. And we have a tradition of six, 700 years, uh, which has been historically defined to produce accommodation between the two or many other communities, right? So his argument, which I find very, very attractive is this, to put it very crudely, he said that the Europeans are actually get, uh, trying to persuade us to say that there is a community of blood. And uh, as a Hindu, I have a blood relation with other Hindus. So he thinks that this is completely fraudulent. He says that, you know, what is the connection between me, a Bengali speaking Hindu living in Bengal and uh, somebody who is living in Madras, who is Tamil speaking, whose food is different, whose social habits and modes are different, right? I have no real blood connection with them, right? The only connection that you can have with people in the world is the connection of neighborliness. He would say that God has, for some chance, you know, put somebody next to you, right? It's not that you have chosen. God has decided to do it. To do it. I think we can also have a secular argument. We can say that history has decided to put my neighbor into the next apartment. But his argument is that if he stays in the next apartment, then we grow relationships or interdependences among ourselves, right? Through, he uses a term from the Gita, uh, which was used in a very different uh, meaning in the Gita, but he transfers the meaning. Uh, the Sanskrit word is sama dukkha sukhata. Sama means equal, dukkha means suffering, sukha means happiness, sa means nest. So the same happiness and suffering nest, that is, uh, you know, that is, uh, that is what his, he says we should mean by belonging, you know, having the same experience of the world. And he thinks that we have the same experience of the world arising up from the material world in which we live. So if there's a flood, it does not discriminate between Muslims and Hindus. He's making an argument which I hear every day on the TV now, we are all in it together. So he thinks that it's from the material world that we build up the civilization and build up these connections of Samadukha Sukhata, of belonging of this kind. And ultimately his argument is that in India, we must have, we must find a way of having two communities. The community of being Hindus and Muslim, which is fulfilling for us, which we should not go, give up. But we must also find a way of producing a political community because that is a level at which we also have some of the Prasukata. So, his argument is an argument which says that there must be different forms of community which are based on different principles. And one is religious, one is political, and we need both if India has to emerge into uh, independence you know, from British rule. Finally, in just two minutes, um, I think I, I should not pretend, and it would be uh, illogical to say, that all of Indian nationalist thought is like this. I think the field of Indian nationalist thought is a field of context, a conflict between this tradition, which originates in people like Budev and then runs through Gandhi uh, quite strongly, through Tagore, who has some interesting differences with Gandhi, Nehru, who borrows from both Gandhi and Tagore in some ways. So this is one tradition, or Maulan Azad, who is the Muslim representative of this kind of thinking. And a line of Hindu nationalist thinking represented by people like Savarkar, the, who is the originator of the idea from which the present ruling party of India has emerged. And there's also a parallel Muslim side to that, which leads to the creation of Pakistan. But do not believe for a moment that Indian Islamic thought was all pro-Pakistani thought. Indian Islamic thought also had a tradition, which is this kind of a pluralistic tradition. So I wanted to make two points about India. I think at the time of independence for accidents of the historical conjuncture, it's the pluralist tradition of thinking about nationalism, this anti-national nationalism, this anti-European nationalist <laughs> national nationalism, that won out. And 
it instituted the state. I've written this in a paper I gave to Nadia Urbinati uh, a few months back. They created a constitution which produced a state, which I think should be accurately called a non-national state. Because the state that the Indian constitution produced is not a state like the European nation state. I think they were quite clear-headed about it. They wanted to create an institutional structure which was deliberately different from the European nation state. I think they succeeded to some extent, but there are two great problems with that. One is they did not think it through entirely. And I'll finish with the last point, which I think is a more complicated point, more difficult point for somebody like me who is an intellectual. I think one of the major problems for the Indian, uh, Indian nationalist leaders like Nehru was they wanted to create a state which was totally unlike the European nation state. But the language through which they thought even about that state was the language of the European nation state, which they had learned, which they had inherited, and which is the only language in which modern political thinkers can think. We do not have a language which is different. If we want to make a language which is different, we cannot jump out of that language. You know, language doesn't work like that. What we need to do is to work against that language from inside and then produce something which can seriously articulate you know, this task of a state, which is not like the European nation state of the 19th and the early 20th century. And I think we should probably do it collaboratively because I think Western states are now into a sociological situation, which is more like the situation that was in India with much greater challenges of diversity and things like that. So my um, conclusion is that we should revisit the liberal communitarian debate. But in some of my work, I make a distinction between uh, puzzles and questions. Uh, I would argue that a puzzle is a field about which people are thinking. And questions are forms in which the puzzles have already been structured so that you know the question can have only a range of answers. And I think what I saw in the promise of the of the title of this conference, the I saw a distinction between the title and the subtitle. So I thought that we get a chance in this conference to say that we should rethink the relation between the community and the individual, but we should actually step out of the frame of the liberal communitarian debates of the 80s and 90s and think a bit more widely and also look at how people have thought about the question of the political world and political community in the non-European world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for a very sophisticated presentation. That was extremely enlightening. Um, I, I know I really appreciate it. Um, I see a question already from uh, Craig Calhoun, and then I will take one from the chat. And if anyone else would like to get my attention, please do so. We have uh, just under 15 minutes for conversation before passing to the last panel. Please go ahead, Craig. Oh, I'm sorry. My question will take 20 minutes. No, I, I will. Uh limit but that was extremely stimulating um and uh, uh Sudipta, this was great and we need to have our own conversation i would prefer to have it when we can meet face to face but that's another question the i just want to come on a couple of things starting with comments near your end i take the point about the as you call it, non-national uh, construction of India. But I want to say there are elements of that in many national traditions, including in Europe. So the, from the 17th century to um, the 19th, European states engaged in ethnic cleansing and parts of this continues. And so there is a dominant tradition of producing um, national homogeneity. But in some considerable part, there's a minority tradition of the nation being like this image that you've given of the non-national. That is, it is the nation that can overcome communal divisions, regional divisions, religious divisions, and so forth. Um, India is always a little odd also because in many ways, what is called communal in India is closer to the model, the dominant model of 
nation deployed in, in Western European thinking, that is um, categorical, um, ethnicized and so forth. Um, but you've called attention to a lot of um, complexities with that. So I just having noted that there's this tradition quickly, um, when we invoke religion, um, it's worth thinking of all the different things that are invoked um, from personal identity to the congregation, uh, yeah. more important in some religions than others. Um, the sort of categorical dimension, as I call it, of similarity can be at large, all Hindus, but there are internal factions in that, as you suggest, and that's true everywhere. Um, not all Catholics identify with Opus Dei um, and, and so forth. The, um, there are site-specific names. There are temples in the Hindu world. There are pilgrimages um, in Catholic and Muslim world. There, the ident there are constructions of religious identity around these, around going places. Um, there are specialist versions in many religions, monasteries and, and other um, sites, which become symbolically loaded, but also are, are ways of, of belonging. And um, and there are practices, uh, which close to what you talk about with um, links to strangers and things, but there are a variety of, of ways. So uh, people can pray together who don't know each other and have never met because they share some world of practices or that can break down and it doesn't get shared or whatever. <coughs> um, so there's all this complexity as there is in general for the kinds of collectivities. I'm gonna see if I can take the time to make two more quick points condensing myself. One is in relation to Hegel. Um, Hegel thinks family within a pretty Western European notion of family of his time. So there's no category of kinship. If Hegel had been a reader of modern social anthropology or familiar with very many non-Western societies, family would be situated not only in relation to community and state and market, but in relation to kinship more broadly. Um, and kinship, literally kinship, that is the extension of relationships, but also in many places, clanship, um, caste in India, other things that are categorical constructions rather than purely relational constructions. And so it seems important that family also opens out in this way. Um, it doesn't succeed in scaling up um, in the ways that nation or something does, but it, it does open out in all of that. The, um, so sorry, could, could we actually... yeah, I, will, I will wind this up. There's one last comment, which is just, we should see the um, individual and the nation as twin born. So very much in the spirit of the historical sociology that Sudipta wants, we get them together. We get the individual as unit of the nation um, and the nation composed of individuals um, out of the same history. I'll stop. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, it's... you're right, you're right. To cut should, I, should I respond? Um, yes, I, I, if, if you would like to, or if you would like me to gather two more questions, I can do that. No, these are very good questions. So let me respond very briefly. Because as uh, Craig said, that, you know, if you think that these uh, the questions that I raised are interesting and important, we should continue the discussion. Um, in a couple of points, um, you know, in the dissenting tradition, for accidental reasons, you know, I was reading the book by Moses Head, you know, about uh, the Jewish nation. And the historical point is very interesting is during Marxist time, uh, when Marx also writes, the Jewish question. But I felt that, of course, in, in Europe, there are these um, you know, dissenting traditions. Um, and some of the dissenting traditions, you know, which are traditions of uh, groups like the Jewish community, uh, who have this angular relationship with the nation which is coming into being, because at the time when he's writing, the nation in the full form have, has not yet come into being. And I think it is particularly at those moments, uh, if we read the theoretical thinking of some of these communities and their intellectuals, we can get ideas which are very productive. Secondly, on the religious question, I think it's very, very interesting. I'm actually now doing some work on uh, the version of tradition because I also partly work on philosophical aesthetics. 
that the Vaishnav was an absolutely wonderful philosophical aesthetic theory of the world. But in their case, they also have a highly sophisticated theory about what does it mean for a Vaishnav to have a relationship with God. His relationship as an individual, his relationship with a few people whose intensity of worship is like his own, right? And then uh, ghostly, uh, where people meet regularly, have singing and things like that. Then, of course, also a slightly abstract version of Sampradaya, which is their sect, you know, where people can be in far flung areas, but they're still part of their community. So I think it, when I look at religious communities in India, ways of being a religious community also differ significantly between the Hindus, the Muslims, and the Buddhists. The Buddhists have a strong congregational uh, element in their religiosity, which neither the Hindus nor the Muslims have. The Muslims have to some extent, but not the Hindus. And finally, I entirely agree with you about Hegel. Tony's, I think, thinks about kinship a little bit, you know, kinship, clan, etc. When Tony thinks about blood, he makes references to these. And of course, I entirely agree with you that individual and the nation are twin born, but it is only one kind of individual. That, you know, but that individual is, of course, you know, created by the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two, two more questions, and we would like to, to keep this on the briefer side since we do have one final sure. discussion. Um, let me turn first to David Rasmussen and then to Albena, uh, who was just here a moment ago and who may reappear. But please go ahead, David. Uh, uh, a fascinating lecture. Um, uh, let me begin with what I think is the puzzle to, in order to get to the question. Uh, you, In the beginning of the uh, lecture, you referred to uh, a, a short discussion of of Hegel's philosophy of right and the way Marx took it up. And now you mentioned the, the Jewish question, which makes me feel that I'm even more certain about this. And you said um, that Marx never changed his mind about what the state should do. And he's a complete Hegelian in this regard. And I, I agree with you. I think that's exactly right. Um, and then uh, to uh, jump quickly to your uh, analysis of the uh, of the nation state and uh, uh, various other contributions. Uh, I gather what you are uh, what what you are suggesting is, is what we would call a perfectionist state, and that's very problematic in a modern kind of uh, uh, Western context. That is, and I don't want to go into all the reasons about it. But you you uh, and I think this is what's uh, what's the question behind the puzzle is you think that the modern state should be something more uh, than it is. And uh, I would be very interested to know uh, precisely what that is. Hard question. Uh, hard question because uh, it might not be intrinsically hard to philosophers who have thought about this for a long time. I haven't thought about this for a long time. Uh, I have thought about the question of nationalism, individuals, etc., uh, in relation with my work on, you know, uh, the intellectual response to modernity in India. So very briefly, um, you know, on um, I'm I'm relieved that you think what I said about Marx uh, submitting to Hegel completely on this question is true, because uh, that does not uh, belie, you know, all the highly sophisticated criticisms of uh, the philosophy of right in the very early piece, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, generally, which uh, has, uh, I think, very, very interesting. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the critique of the bureaucracy of the universal class, that sort of thing. But I still feel that, you know, this has been one of the major problems, not merely of Marx. In Marx's case, I think it's a question of unmindfulness because we cannot expect Marx to have uh, thought through for us, you know, every single question that would uh, appear in the next 150 years. So in Marx's case, I think it is a matter of um, inattention. He simply expected that, you know, the responsibilities of community building can be given over to the state. 
But I think it is more a complaint on my part against the later Marxist socialist tradition. And I feel what is interesting is that I'm not very surprised that the communist tradition did not think about that. But I'm a bit surprised that the socialist tradition also did not think about this very clearly. On the question of perfectionism, I yeah. have to think through this a bit more. But let me make one uh, quick point. You know, perfectionism is, this is partly because of the work that I'm doing on Vaishnavas and religious, uh, Vaishnava theology. You know, they, they're also perfectionists in the sense that they believe that God, uh, the figure of Krishna, is the figure of the perfect realization of humanity. But the perfect realization of humanity means that, you know, nobody would ever realize it. But it's important to have that perfect image because without that perfect image, there would be no impulse in the empirically existing individual, you know, to rise above themselves. So the um, perfectionism in that sense, you know, is something like uh, Kantian regulative ideal sort of thing. So, but I have to think about this a bit more. I'm sorry that I'm unprepared for the question, but you know, it's, a, it's a very important question. And I don't want to respond to it without thinking about it. Thank you so much, uh, Sudipta. And I'm sorry that we have to end this part of the conversation here. Um, uh, Lisa, did I see you raise your hand for something? No, okay. I wanted to thank both Lisa Anderson and Sudipta Kaviraj uh, for uh, your wonderful, wonderful talks that were really thought provoking and I think sparked a lot of excellent discussion which really could have gone on and it is honestly still going on in the chat and the Q&A. And so I would invite especially you Sudipta to, to take a, a closer look. We can actually, if you want, uh, we can probably continue this over uh, chat. I'm not very good at chat, but email. Yes, well, then I will, I will absolutely, we will put the, um, the students in touch with you and, um, and maybe we can reconvene sometime soon. And um, I, I really do appreciate both of your uh, contributions very much. And now I will turn uh, the, the, the mic over to Volker uh, and Sophia, uh, who will guide us through the remainder of, of the seminars and what is for me a, a highlight every year um, coming up right now. We want to take a five minute, really five minutes break. Um, so that, you know. Okay, a hard five. A hard five, and uh, so all the groups can start getting their presentations ready. Also, uh, I ask that each group please let me know who will be sharing the relevant presentations um, so that I can give you authorization to share your screens. Thank you. To the presentations of the summer school workshops next in five minutes for everyone. Thank you. David? 
David, can you hear me? Uh, unmute, unmute yourself. Unmute. Uh. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. Hi. <laughs> so how are you? <laughs> uh, I'm okay. Uh, Zoom kicked me out, so I, I'm I'm just back in. What is uh, what did we establish? What time do we start with the student presentations? Uh, in 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 four minutes. Oh in great! Three, so four I minutes. Just, you know. Student presentations in four minutes. Well, it's it's. <laughs> Let's find time to chat and, and have a drink together. No? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Let's yeah, say uh, after everything and have a, a proper drink and maybe, you know, sing or dance and whatever. Mm. <laughs> uh, with kids. Yes, and, uh, yes, and whatever, pets. whatever. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and, and you're who's the little lady? That, that thing, um, the thing you did the other day. Yes. Hi. You're going to send me the uh, the 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 <laughs> session that I missed the other day. I will. I'm I'm making a note. Yes, I had to edit it uh, because it was very long, so I had to edit some. But it's ready. I'll send it. I'm making a note. Here, David. Thank you for asking. I'm very flattered. By the way, you're. Uh, have you seen? Have, hey, 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 Albina. Yeah. Uh, just a second. I'm going to get something. I'll show you. Yeah. Okay. I'm here. Just a just a minute. Yeah. Here it is. You're you're in this one. What is this? See it? Ah, I haven't seen it. No. That's, that's, no I'm, I'm sure you have. Here it is. Look. Only on, only online. At no, the not the hard copy, not the real thing. Oh. Uh -huh. uh -huh, well, you're <laughs> If you send me an address, if you send me, uh, they give they give me a bunch of these things. Okay. So if I'll you send, send you me your address, I'll send yeah. you some. I'd like to have the real, the yeah. real thing. Mm -hmm. Very pleased. Yeah, it's fun to have it. You can give it out. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, anyway, prescribe it to it's students. To... <laughs> it's it's actually very nice to see everybody in their own homes. So you, you are you are becoming an international figure. Ah, uh, inevitably, inevitably. Can be helped. <laughs> yeah. Amazing! That word has become has become it's fine, it's part of the vocabulary now. Well, yeah, your, it's your it's, word, your contribution. I, I particularly loved something that uh, Alea Ep um, said just after the debate on my book. She said that I have had the guts to to execute the original project of the Frankfurt School, bringing the political economy back. They never actually did it because they didn't know much political economy. So I just did it. <laughs> well, there were those other Frankfurt well, figures like yeah, Pollock yeah, yeah, yeah. and so forth. Well, Klaus is my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I jump in here. Well, that's right. From uh, Jonathan's group to for the presentation, so maybe if they're ready, uh, they can have Meanwhile, Sophia, just let me say just one word what you're going to do because perhaps not everyone is aware. Also the larger public, you know, watching us outside there on Facebook and YouTube and all those channels, what we're going to do now. Oh, this is streaming. Oh, oh this is in streaming, right? You see oh, right live on YouTube up there. Okay, so uh, what happened over the last, four or five days, um, there was also the summer school going on and participants were divided into three groups. And those three groups were conducted by the first one by Jonathan Lawrence, that was on individuals, communities and the ambiguous liberal imperative. Um, uh, and the other one was uh, conducted by Albina Zmanova, by Albina, on the political economy of liberal communities. And I did the, the, the second one was on the unresolved strains in liberalism and communitarianism, okay? Now, um, 
what the goal of these groups were that, well, the students they, that they come up and participants that they come up with their own thoughts on these issues. And they're going to make a very short and quick and condensed presentation of their thoughts. So I would suggest that we would we start with Jonathan's group, okay? Thank you, Folker. I believe that Marco will be sharing his screen. Yes, just a minute, guys. Hello, everyone. Hi. Okay, uh, can you see the PowerPoint show? Yep. Yes. Yes, Marcos. Okay, guys, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, Angela will start uh, the presentation. Uh, I hope you like it and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, can you guys um, listen to me? Yes, Angela. Okay, thank you very much. So. First of all, Marcus, can you please pass the first slide? So first of all, good afternoon or good evening. I don't know where you guys are. Um, we are gonna talk a little bit about populist governments and uh, we're gonna do a more specific analysis of the Bolsonaro's case, especially because um, in our group there are mainly Brazilians, but uh, we, we wanted to talk about that because basically we've seen uh, uh, like the the uh, evolution of a lot of the cases, but um. So I will start. Can you please pass it, Marcos? Please again. Okay. So first of all, um, we will start with the discussions that we had on the workshop, um, and then uh, we first start questioning uh, about the state organization and how the uh, how um it influenced and damage. Um, the idea of the democratic system. We also discussed about multiculturalism and the dissociation from identity. Like, is there um, something that it needs to link those two things? Or is there something that is basically like, um, show that they are uh, opposites and it's not like, cannot actually uh, link, have a link between them. We also talk a lot about the public sphere and the private sphere um, to see to what extent like the public sphere is actually disappearing and uh, the private sphere is actually taking um, this, uh, this position. Um, we also talk a lot about populism, populism uh, all around the world. So from Brazil, from Turkey, from Russia, um, the United States, UK, and also the idea of the crisis of expectation, because basically we think that both uh, things are very linked. So populists will rise when there is a crisis of expectation. We also, um, we vote um, Mem Asmanova text when she talks a little bit about the idea of this illogical phenomenon uh, of economic and cultural liberalization that we agree that there is a economical liberalization, but in the same way, there is this conservative look towards um, the cultural liberalization. And at the end, we kind of like, um, discuss a little bit more about the idea of balance that we need to have this balance between the civil society, the state and the individuals to um, to kind of overcome this two perspective and this uh, ambiguity between the uh, individualistic and the communitarian perspective. Can you also pass Mar Marcus again? Thank you. So very quick, as we said, we talked a lot about populism and then we just um, selected three of the populist ideas that are the one with Trump, Bolsonaro and Viktor Orban in Hungary. And then I'm gonna read kind of like their slogans, which with Trump is make America great again, with Bolsonaro is a Brazil above everything and God above all. And then with Viktor Orban, um, we have like the idea of, you also have the right to know uh, when uh, what we are doing in Brussels. And then like um, in this idea, we kind of try to demonstrate that um, there is an, uh, 
a characteristic that it's uh, it's presented in almost all of them. So this idea of crisis, this idea of anti-globalization feeling, um, and also the ones that were left behind. So for example, in Trump, uh, you will see the domination of migrants with the Mexicans, with people that come from Latin America, um like you also have the anti-globalization uh, feeling that we also see for example when we have uh the, the 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 pandemic and the money that was taken off from who because the united states feels that like there is this kind of the um the whole countries or the whole system against them we have the idea that was also brought by um uh, Mr. Macedo, what the idea of the left behind. And with Bolsonaro, we have the political and economic crisis in Brazil that helped as well the idea of the real Brazilians against the corrupted ones. With Victor, we see a health crisis that were happening in Hungary, um, the anti-migration discourse, especially with 2015. And then basically what we can see is this idea of the people versus the elite, the discontentment of the actual system in a period of crisis and this anti-globalization and loss of sovereignty discourse. Yeah, can you please pass it, Marcus? So now I'm just gonna pass um, for my friend Stanislav. Um, it's, it's not easy for us to conceptualize uh, these various illiberal swells that we call populism. Um, I'd like us to consider two difficulties in particular. Uh, can you guys hear me, and, by the way? Yes, it's okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, so two difficulties. Uh, number one, we might find that uh, attaching continuity to these phenomena, uh, which enables us as theorists to consider these phenomena together, actually ends up reducing really valuable heterogeneity to homogeneity. In the interest of eliminating difference, uh, we theorists end up evacuating particular calls for return to local interests of their individuality. And we end up identifying attachment to the particular as antipathy to the general, which isn't necessarily true. And here again, Professor Macedo's comments from Tuesday and Wednesday are really valuable. So the first difficulty is reduction. The second difficulty is reification. We, pre we pretend to discover a natural phenomenon with essential properties in what we call populism. But Plato once said that the mathematician can only tell us about one part of justice, and we shouldn't assume the stance of a natural scientist toward multifaceted political phenomena. Next slide, please. We propose instead to think about these populisms in the terms of family resemblance. The family resemblances between these political phenomena, however, still mask the following problem. At what point does a difference in degree become a difference in kind? For example, in the table you see on the slide, if each group only shares one letter with the group before it, at some point the last group doesn't share anything with the first. So how profitable is it to consider these as commensurable types. Next slide, please. Now, in the absence of conceptual uniformity, uh, our contemporary populisms might nevertheless hold in common a way of thinking about the public and the private spheres. What if we were to consider a narrative of the ambiguous imperative of liberalism through which we could glimpse some of the conditions of possibility of these liberal swells? Now, thinking about the Americas, Consider the post-war success of free trade, of the entrepreneurial state, of market logic. In Brazil's case, Bolsonaro's rise really underscores the settling of what was once an open question of economic organization. But more than that, it, it settles the question of the balance between the public and the private. So with the incre incremental emptying out of the Brazilian public sphere and the enlargement of the private sphere, what Professor Asmanova observed in the case of distrustful Europeans of 2007 comes to apply even more strongly to Bolsonaro's Brazil after the financial crisis of 2008. The state redistributes less as private industry lobbies for more. And I quote Professor Asmanova, a new public agenda has appeared in recent years in response to sharpened sensitivity to economic and political risk, itself linked to fears from the anticipated social impact of globalization. 
mainly insecurity and the maintenance of a standard of living, as well as physical unsafety. What we could refer to as the new order and safety agenda has four constitutive elements, physical security, political order, cultural estrangement, and income insecurity. Next slide, please. Now, the public face of the post-war liberal democratic consensus was a commitment to employment as a sort of vehicle for growth and social stability. Globalized, unrestricted, endless trade wasn't only solicited, it was encouraged, and it succeeded in reshaping the Americas according to the investment portfolios of a few multinational corporations. But the point of all this trade was supposed to be cultural diversity, exchange, hybridization, not only in the interest of preventing another world war, but also of lifting enough people out of poverty to usher in the commercial virtues of liberal democratic community. The good pursued by post-war liberal democracies was low, but it was reliable. And so the post-material agenda, which was enabled by free trade, and moved away from bread and butter issues like income, housing, and celebrated the self, autonomy, lifestyle, self-expression. Above all, it celebrated cultural diversity. So how did this work out in Brazil? Next slide, please. Now, in Brazil's case, a growing contingent of the population could be said to view unemployment in terms of fear, loss, and marginalization. Now, I wanna be clear, Professor Asmanova uh, talks here about distrustful Europeans, uh, but I think that this applies equally well to the Brazilians that voted Bolsonaro's administration in. The post-material politics of identity, self-creation, and freedom now accompany an unstable material politics of globalization outsourced jobs and markets that never seem to be free enough. Free trade increased the range of economic opportunities at the expense of job security. As more and more citizens fell into precarity, as more and more political actors continued to insist on the inescapability of globalized, unfettered trade, as more and more the public sphere became privatized in search of efficiency, citizens had fewer and fewer reprieves from a marketized, individualized life. It was precisely this apprehension about the social and cultural effects of an apparently inescapable market logic that compelled citizens to turn to governance for a way out. And so we come to the politics of fear. And at this point, I'd like to give the floor to my colleagues as we more carefully consider the case of Brazil. Next slide, please. Hello, my name is Matheus, uh, and I'm gonna read a piece of thought we wrote on specifications of Bolsonaro's case. Latin America has a history of populist governments, a region with large expressions of poverty, corruption, scandals, and inequality, is a fertile ground for populists to articulate narratives supported by the resentment of oppressed groups towards their respective rulers. In Brazil, the populist wave started in the first half of the 20th century with Getúlio Vargas, who opposed the agrarian oligarchy with the support of industrial patrons seeking modernization and income increase in the country. To conquer their space, aspiring populists who aim to represent the voice of the people have increasingly relied on political marketing strategies to shape their image and communication seeking to echo a message that resonates with the populist desires. In the Brazilian tech context of the 21st century, both former President Lula and the current President Jair Bolsonaro appear to be populists. However, they are antagonist characters. Since Bolsonaro's campaign was fundamentally based on the reject rejection of Lula and the Workers' Party, here and after PT. Due to the change in the Brazilian social structure that occur occurred during the PT government with a rising middle class, Bolsonaro had before him an electorate different from the previous one. While the for former president, uh, President Lula, dealt more with a population characterized by extreme poverty, frustrated by economic stagnation and inflation, President Bolsonaro faces a middle class frustrated with public services and corruption. In a second moment, the economic crisis 
affected more strongly different levels of the population, which experience sensations of economic tightening and feels insecure in relation to the country's high crime rates, being frustrated with the results of the Workers' Party government. In a third moment, the attack suffered by Bolsonaro paints the candidate as a martyr, personifying his messianic appeal, as his middle name, Messias, suggests. Bolsonaro, in his winning election, proposes to end the establishment, fighting the current system as an outsider. His political communication is aggressive, anti-workers' party, anti-communist, and anti-corruption. The candidate defends patriotic, conservative values, such as family, Christian traditions, and extreme neoliberalist policies, a position that ends up putting him against minority movements. Bolsonaro faced an opposition composed by, mainly by academic elites and social minorities, such as women, the native Brazilian people, and the black population, and the LGBTQIA plus community that organized the Not Him movement. Uh, well, furthermore, Bolsonaro promised economic growth and fighting corruption with the help of his super ministers, Paulo Guedes, the liberal economist from Chicago School of Economics, and Sergio Moro, the former judge who was responsible for putting Lula in jail. Bolsonaro did most of his campaign through social media and messaging apps, having corporation-funded groups in his favor for to in favor to disseminate electoral content and even to attack opponents with information weapons, such as fake news. The success of populist political marketing strategies depends on context. It is clear that social change, corruption scandals, and economic crisis were important factors in changing the narrative presented by the candidates, who knew how to take advantage of this context to leverage their campaigns. In an interview to El País, Professor, uh, Professor Finchelstein comments about a new type of populism and argues that even though it is always presented with the idea of reformulating democracy in authoritarian terms with no reference to the fascist tradition, these new populists make an explicit attempt to return to the central elements of fascism, racism, political violence, and regarding Bolsonaro, to theoretical complements to dictatorship. In one of the main highlighted speeches during former President Dilma's impeachment voting, Bolsonaro paid tribute to the Colonel Carlos Ustra, a famous torturer of the military dictatorship in Brazil. To Finchelstein, the current Brazilian president is one of the populists more inclined to fascism he has ever seen. In summary, Bolsonaro, with a 27-year-old career as a federal deputy, detached himself from his image as a traditional politician, and he started to use the populist approach in order to run his presidential campaign. Therefore, we can conclude that such strategy is based on the weaknesses of the representative democratic system in Brazil and put in check by creating space for a populist-oriented figure. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you to the group. As a matter of fact, it was the group of the Americas, right? Because we had the problem of time difference. So Jonathan, he conducted the group of, um, of summer school participants from, from the Americas. Now, I, I see there is one question from David. Do you, do you want to ask it, David? Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you guys for the presentation. It was really, really nice and I mean, enlightening, especially on, on Brazil, because uh, here at the other part of the, of the world, we don't know much about it. So um, my question actually comes from, from the study of populism in, in this, uh, as you said, dichotomic narrative between the corrupt elite and the people. Um, I mean, there's, there's many uh, philosophers amongst which uh, Ernesto Laclau who talk about the fact that, I mean, this simplistic vision of reality, in fact, uh, like warps the concept of the, of the mass, because I mean, what is in fact the mass? And I would like 
uh, you to know what you think about this. I mean, can we actually draw this simplistic assumption and can the mass in, in fact, I mean, be described as only the mass or the populace? Uh, or, I mean, when, when in fact we are in democracies and we have different types of pluralities and, and different types of, you know, ideas going around. So can we, can we draw this distinction? Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, Marcus, could you stop sharing the, the, the screen, please? Good. So you, you, your, your, your answer, Angela, Isabella, Mateus. Stanislav. So you want us to tell you what the mass is? It's <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> no, I want you. I want you to know what what I, I want to know what you think about this division. And uh, I mean, what? How would you comment on that? Just just that. Don't want to know about the mass. Um, well, I'll, I'll make a comment. It's it's an emotional appeal uh, to a particular extent of, of revenge. People vote for Trump uh, because he's angry and he's angry like you're angry. So everybody who feels that anger feels like they're a part of this, I don't know, this emotional group. Uh, and they're bound by particular aesthetics. They're bound by particular historical grievances. Um, but the lines are very blurry because a good number of Sanders supporters supported Trump in 2016. We're still trying to figure out this mess in political science. I, I, I don't know how to properly distinguish between groups at this point. Mateus? Uh, and maybe in our case, we can relate the mass to poverty. So the mass is the poor people. Here, uh, we can establish this relation because uh, since the inequality levels are very high in Brazil, and we have a tradition of slavery that uh, has its effects even nowadays, with racism and favelas, I think you you all maybe have heard or seen movies talking about that. Uh, we can relate the mass to poverty and to insatisfaction with public services as well. Angela. Okay, so um, also I think maybe in the Brazilian context, we don't know much more about the other context, but I think we can talk more about ours. We see that it's not a homogeneous kind of group because you see that there are movements like not him uh, that we call here Eli now here we have movements. I mean, and even in the elections, we seen that even though Bolsonaro won with the, uh, I would say like the the majority, like if you see on the first. Um, on the first partial of the elections, there were other um, candidates that also received like some, uh, I'm not gonna say the same kind of amount, but also like a, a, a good amount of, of votes, you know? So, I mean, it's super hard. And to be honest, I think um, this kind of discourse is only, only polarized even more um, a society, especially in Brazil, that is already like so much polarized. And I think like it's it, it actually, um, uh, I know that some um, some of the, the teachers here will not agree, but I, for example, I think that it actually damages like democracy in the sense because like we are kind of going more through an authoritarian kind of government than a democratic one that see that plurality is some some part of the game of the democratic game. So I would say that that, that would be my answer. Great. I, I think if there if there are no further questions, I, I would thank the first group about this presentation on Bolsonaro's ambiguous liberalism <laughs> and, and, and go on straight ahead with Albina's group, group number three on the political economy of liberal communities. Thank you. Thank you. Alessandro, you want to start? Sharing? Yes, I, th I think I will. Share my screen now. Just give me a sec. Here we go. In the meantime, I'm just, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. It's more a text that will serve our speakers. So I leave the floor to Silvana, who is the first one. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our group uh, is the work, uh, the group three that is the 
the main topic is, is the political economic of liberal communities and the professor that lead us was Professor Ab Ab Albena. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, sum up the main topics that we discuss in, in our workshop uh, before we introduce uh, what uh, our thoughts about this workshop. So we discuss about individualism com versus community, um, the paradox of uh, emancipation that will be our main topic in this presentation uh, and how included immigrants in this, in this system. Um, also, we discuss about the mus Muslim, Muslim versus Christianism. So the recogni recognition and the competition between these two groups. And we also discuss about the dimensions of domination. That is, is another topic that we're gonna talk in our presentation. And also we have some uh, questions uh, during the, the workshops, like uh, and in what type of system we want this kind of equality. We talk a little bit about this. And also how they compete, uh, what they compete for these groups, now, for example, like uh, the Christianism, Christianism and Muslim, Muslim, and what skills are needed for in this competition or this recognition. So to sum up the, the main topics about our present, uh, about our discussion. So our presentation today will be divided in four parts. So we have a brief introduction, a presentation of our problem, a concept, a concept of paradox of emancipation, and a conclusion. Uh, first of all, we would like to uh, start with a quotation from an Italian activist of a far right North League uh, party, Mariano Falcone. Just a second. Um, okay. uh, that says, we can not take on the burden of all these disparate people. Italian has its own problem. This is a battle of legal, legality, social justice, and freedom for our, our people. Uh, he further speaks of et ethnic substitution, attempted is Islami Islamization and the like, likelihood of federal federal social clashes between poor Italians and the growing immigrant population. So this speech uh, was made in August of uh, 2017 at the port city of Salerno, in which was the place where ships docked carrying asylum seekers. But why uh, do we highlight this quote? Why do we start with this quote, our presentation? Because it is pre uh, presents well our society's predi predicament, the le link, sorry, the language of uh, legality, justice, compassion, and humanism quickly deteriorates into xenophobia. That is our main point in about our presentation. Uh, but not only the far right uh, has this hostile discourse about, uh, about xenophobia, but also this, uh, the political center too. For we have other two examples. Uh, for example, the British Labour Party that wrote uh, that the slogan was British British jobs for British workers, and the, in the Netherlands, uh, Premier, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, which pub published a warning to migrants saying behave normally or, or leave the country. So this anti-immigrant discourse often engages to rhetoric of rule of law, economic fairness, social cohesion, freedom, and popular sovereignty within a national community. Well, some people can say, uh, can see this anti-immigrant attitude as a natural instinct of self-preservation. But during our presentation, we will claim that, that this all depends on the social condition. 
uh, we must ask, what are the conditions of possibility of cooperative rather than hostility cultural di diversity? So now I'm going to leave the floor for my colleague, Belk. Sorry about this, but we cannot hear you. Your microphone is off. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, uh, thank you, Silvana. So now we will introduce to you the the problem that we will uh, the, our problem uh, that we will try to analyze in this presentation, which is uh, how the efforts of the West to guarantee a better inclusion and equality are haunted by what Professor Asmanova calls the paradox of emancipation. Um, while we are fighting one type of uh, injustice via inclusion and equality, we further validate and reinforce uh, the unjust system uh, within which equality and inclusion are being sought. As a result, the conflict is perpetuated. We will take the Muslim migrants to Europe as an example in this presentation. So um, modern Western societies are trying to promote tolerance and individualism and granting social and economic liberties um, through their institutions uh, to guarantee a better integration of the Muslim migrants. However, this process may be rising the hatred towards Muslim communities and not the contrary. Muslim migrants uh, and here we are talking about the non-qualified ones, those with uh, low skills, um, seeking work and are mainly em employed in sectors usually referred to as difficult, dirty and dangerous. They, um, for Europeans, they bring down the living standards for blue collar Euro Europeans, uh, which in turn triggers anxiety and expresses itself in, in, in xenophobia, hatred uh, and uh, those, those strangers appear as uh, dangerous. And um, on the other hand, Muslim migrants also develop what we may call a Western phobia, as opposed to Islamophobia, as they think it is dangerous for their identity um, to live and grow in a community that promotes liberal thought. Indeed, they perceive it as a threat for Islam and the Islamic values. Um, we may say that there is a symbolic violence here practiced by um, the European society on Muslims by not granting them um, uh, equal chances into the access to job market, uh, such as the example of Muslim women in France wearing the hijab, hijab who are uh, not allowed um, either in to, to higher education or to jobs, um, and imposing on them a secular system that is not aligned with their beliefs. Um, the beliefs of Muslims, uh, which are ruling with the Sharia law, let's say, and uh, the Islamic teaching, teachings. And uh, this symbolic violence is often translated into a physical violence by these migrants, as it is the only way for them to express their disenchantment with the European system. Um, so this dynamic leads to European xenophobia and Islamophobia more specifically from one part, and to terrorism by Muslims from the other part, as the extreme expression of the mistrust between these two collective identities. So, um, moreover, the conflict between uh, Christians and Muslims is a historical one um, that is considered nowadays to be a cultural construct where Europeans perceive Muslims as barbarians and Muslims perceive Europeans as colonialists and thieves of their golden ages, let's say. So uh, to fully understand the, the conflict, we will, we will review it through the conceptual model of the three-dimensional di uh, domination as developed by Professor Asmanova. Uh, so the first dimension is that of um, relational domination, which emerges when the um, unequal distribution of resources, material resources, but also the, um, uh, I, 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 um, ideational ones like recognition and respect leads to exclusion and inequality. And the second uh, trajectory of domination or dimension of domination, let's say, uh, is a structural that is, it is rooted in the institutions 
where, where which uh, structure the social context, such as laws regulating the practice of religion or the access to the labor market. And the third dimension is that of uh, systemic domination. It concerns the overall system of social relations. Um, it is a matter of the core cultural and economic parameters of society. Indeed, uh, the more we include um, on equal footing everyone with the, without concern for that for the way that general social conditions are generating negative attitudes we are condemning these new these new groups to negative treatments and uh, perpetuating injustice uh, contemporary capit capitalism is marked by extreme total treatments and perpetuate um, sorry by extreme total um, precarization of human existence uh, which affects everyone, the rich and the poor, women and men, and uh, all cultural and social groups more generally. Um, and in this case, this is the case because the competitive pressures have increased in the context of globally integrated free market capitalism. This uh, shapes the context of anxiety, where the main norm is that of, uh, uh, sorry, um, where the Sorry, I, I just lost. Uh, can you can you please put your okay? So um, th this shapes the context um, of anxiety, where the main norm is that of competition, not of cooperation, um, and cultural groups become become shelters from hostile competition and not a positive collective identification. In the course of competition for ever fewer jobs and fewer jobs and fewer public resources, individuals and the groups in which they belong become structured by vertical, vertical and horizontal host hostility, as they are in competition for social status, for material resor resources, uh, generally, generally for, li for life chances. And um, so this is a general introduction. And now uh, Stefania will uh, take, uh, I will give the floor to Stefania to explain more this uh, paradox of emancipation and the uh, three dimensions of uh, domination. Yeah, so I will now introduce the, the case study uh, and apply it to the paradox of emancipation. So in order to fully understand the aforementioned concept and solve it, we would like to present an example that better explains the paradox of emancipation. We will analyze the case of a Muslim migrant arriving to Italy, and we will explore different dimensions of power that they have to face in this new reality. It is important to find the roots of the paradox, and let's start by the first dimension of domination. So the first one is the relational, uh, it mainly focuses on how individuals and groups relate to each other. In our example, it mainly refers to those behaviors of subordination, exclusion, and consequent inequalities to which the Muslims are subjected. For this reason, we discussed that, then, that when a migrant moves to another country, he, she usually looks for easier comfort zone represented by communities with his or same a culture and traditions. The main remedies to solve this dimension of domination could be the promotion of inclusion and equality within individuals and within society too. For instance, giving them full citizenship uh, rights. The second dimension is the structural one. So it is related to the structural aspects of society, such as institutions, uh, which do not discriminate on the basis of um, religion in granting access to employment, schooling, or cultural activities. Indeed, even though migrants are equal before the law and do not suffer a particular form of uh, legal discrimina discrimination in Western Europe, not all of them arrived to Europe in a legal manner or have a legal authorization to stay in the country and or to work. This obviously makes their position weaker and more vulnerable to exploitation, for example, France and the jobs. So it is worth to notice that European countries have removed at least most of the barriers that prevent migrants from being included in the society or are definitely on this path. However, some long-term uh, dynamics are still fostering social hostility by promoting precarity and negative attitudes towards some group, groups persist. So the problem needs to be examined um, as a matter of systemic, not structural injustice. So I will now leave the floor to Alessandro, who will explain the third uh, dimension of domination. 
Yes, thank you. So here we go with the third dimension of uh, um, domination, which is uh, systemic and takes into consideration uh, actually the system of everyday practices in a given context. So uh, we can split this dimension in two sub dimensions. So first, the political economy. So in contemporary economy, precarity has increased for everyone but especially for the lowest strata of uh, the society. And precarity generates hostile attitudes. It forces uh, people to take shelter from competition within closed groups. And this case um, obviously applies to uh, our example of migrants. And the second subdimension is the religious one. Um, so Christian culture is still underlying and latent in European society, despite all the <clears throat> all the secularization pro process and the theoretical uh, laicite um, of the state. So the society is tacitly uh, provided, pervaded by Christian cultures and values. And because of this socioeconomic uh, precarity, uh, the competition among groups and individuals for distribution of life chance is translated into subordination of one group to, an, to the other, obviously the one belonging to the dominant system. So in the context we just presented, we witness a rise of hostility toward migrants. Um, people generally perceive migrants increasing as a threat to their economic interest, and as, an unfair, um, as unfair competitors that tend to lower the salaries as well the minimum standards uh, of labor laws. Migrants are likely to be in a very precarious situation, of course, when they arrive to a new country and willing or forced uh, to accept jobs with lower wages, virtually no social security and less decent uh, contractual uh, conditions. This situation is a paradox as instead of fighting uh, for better conditions of, for all workers, um, they, and we are referring to the um, low qualified workers that like European workers, um, they prefer to simply oppose migration policies while political actions like creating stronger unions or participating in strikes could, do, could be mean, meaningful and spark real change in society um, opposing migration as a whole represent a mere defense of self-interest, which is unlikely to generate any improvement for the local workers in the long term, because it does not target the problem at the root. So again, we see a dichotomy uh, that emerged between conflict and uh, competition. The capital system has the interest to fuel competition between the lower class in order to maintain the salaries low and increase the competitiveness of, the pro of their products um, on the market, of course. So this balance um, between competition and conflict um, is worthy to be further investigated. Also maybe taking into account the, the narrative that constitutes the hegemonic uh, discourse. So as a conclusion, even when all the structural barriers uh, such as discriminatory laws are lifted and we can argue that this, this is the countries, the systemic barriers embedded in the community's cultures and social norms represent the higher, uh, a higher obstacle that can only be overcome in the long term. If real change is the goal, the means has to be addressing these systemic dynamics. So ch changing the social norms and the deep beliefs of a community, social economic norms, of course, and the deep belief of a community takes time and require long-term interventions and investment in essentially uh, public services like education and healthcare. To fight systemic injustice, we need to build what Professor, Professor Osmanova calls a political economy of trust, securing good livelihood for everyone so that the competitive pressures are basically eliminated and only then strangers will not longer be perceived as a dangerous threat. Great, thank you for this very elaborate 
Yes, may may I ask a question to one of, of, of you? Sure, there's Giancarlo and then there is also Jaime. Go, Giancarlo. Yeah. May I? Because why you insist so much uh, on the concept uh, of domination? When you describe a situation of inequality, of injustice, why you need to apply the concept of domination, which is uh, probably describing another kind of relation um, of direct oppression uh, uh, and abuse of legality in, uh, uh, on other people? Why, why that use of the concept of domination? Well, if I may... Um, you want to, to answer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can um, give you an answer. I think that in... Well, it's a complex answer. I think that domination in, like in, in a Gramscian way is composed, has two components. So on one, on one sense, on one direction, we have the coercion. And on, on the other sense, we also have a softer kind of domination. So domination is not equal to use of force, exactly, hegemony uh, is not equal to use of force as pure coercion, but it can be also understood in a broader sense. So this is my percep perception. I don't know if somebody else wants to add something else. Yeah, we mainly... Um use and uh, try to apply also the um, uh, main concepts that uh, Professor Advanova showed us during uh, uh, the workshop uh, and try to also to apply them to a specific uh, case study. So maybe, yeah, as uh, Alessandro already said, maybe also the, the word domination is uh, um, should be perceived in a different way as a uh, we can imagine like the domination with the use of force. Um, yeah, we just uh, try to apply these uh, three pillars, let's say, um, as uh, uh, the professor showed us to a specific uh, um, case study in order to um, understand how the paradox of emancipation works. Albina, you want to say something? Uh, I'm actually very uh, satisfied with uh, Alessandro's um, uh, answer because indeed a domination is more than just sheer oppression and um, that is what, what uh, it, it, this concept tends to convey. In the Frankfurt School, or the original, you know, the first generation, for instance, they made a distinction between a repression because there is, in every society, you, you're not completely free to do what you want. And, sur and, and oppression, a surplus repression. But, but these categories could not really capture you know, this idea that is still in, in, in Marxian, original Marxian social thought, that the social system, the very dynamic, the very logic of the social system traps people in certain kind of practices, uh, for instance, the pursuit, the competitive pursuit of profit, to which they're all um, captured even if they're winners in the distribution of wealth. So this is what the concept of domination captures. At least that's what I'm trying to do with my work. Thank, Thank you for you that question, Giancarlo. Yes, it's okay. Providing not every kind, not every injustice or inequality is domination, but right. we can distinguish between different situations where there is a uh, the, 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 when, when there is a coercion, yeah, in right. the, the Gramscian sense, which is also. Jaime. Yes, um, my question was, was more regarding uh, the, the proposed solution, so the political economy of trust, which has the focus of, uh, of enhancing or, or, or putting more funds or more efforts into the public sphere to subvert to what Albina claims is subverting uh, the systemic logic of capitalism, so the competitive pursuit of profit. But how does that actually work? Because we have welfare states, or, or we've had very um, well-equipped well welfare states, which have ultimately not really overcome the, the, the operational logic of capitalism, so who have ultimately 
um, kept the logic of pursuit of profit, uh, regardless of strong uh, securing public institutions? <clears throat> that would be my question. Thank you. Who want to go? Uh, apologies, perhaps uh, that question was uh, directed directly to Alvina, but uh, of course. Yeah, I don't, it, 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 the group did not quite discuss that aspect. There was no time. Uh, but uh, just quickly to answer that, maybe uh, since you're raising it, um, it is not just um, building, uh, going back to the welfare state, because the welfare state, uh, we all, <laughs> the older ones of us still remember that it was all about growth and redistribution and uh, uh, was based on a very strong capital labor alliance in favor of capitalism, in fact, mm -hmm. and, and, and this global competitive logic of capitalism uh, would, would persist. Uh, but a political economy of trust would also uh, use things like um, universal basic income and something I call uh, universal basic employment, job sharing, in order to reduce the competitive pressure. So the, the point is, is any way we can reduce the competitive pressures, we do that. Good, great, Albina. Uh, there is one last question in the chat. So given that we start to run late, I, I read it out. If if there is an answer, then let it be short, please, okay? Question by Stanislav. I sometimes worry that we over-theorize social or political phenomena. It seems like your group described the consequences of elected officials being insufficiently liberal. They cared about liberalizing trade without taking into account the challenges of liberalizing cultural life. Could we solve some of these issues by agitating on behalf of liberals who mean what they say, who tell us that culture and trade aren't the same? That's a mm. question. I, I, I think perhaps we can, we can have this as a conclusion of your group. And uh, as, I mean, if otherwise, given that we have one group left and we don't want to, we don't, I mean, in, in Europe, it starts to, to be dinner time, in particular Northern Europe. So, so let's 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 cut it off here. Thank you very much for the political economy of liberal communities, uh, and we conclude with very traditional uh, discussion on liberalism and communitarianism and how we can go beyond. So, Jaime, I guess you you start. Sorry, my, my mic was muted. Okay. Um, yes, indeed, as the title conveys, unresolved strains of liberalism and communitarianism. We'll be discussing uh, essentially, uh, and in the first place, the critiques or the main critique of communitarianism towards liberalism, uh, which was divided in uh, three specific uh, points of critique, which is the universalism versus particularism, the debate over the self, and the, the political debate and the differences between communitarianism uh, politics and liberal politics. Um, so, the first, uh, the first and more important, most important assumption, I, I assume, of the liberal, uh, the liberal claim is there as an original position, which allows to view human condition from a perspective of eternity, which is all roles, uh, specifically leading to a universal theory of uh, justice. So, uh, so a, a theory of justice that is universally true for all. Um, regardless of the fact that Rawls allows for a possibility uh, of liberalism uh, not exploring, uh, not being exported, sorry, at all times to all places, it is com the communitarian's critique that standards of justice must be found in forms of life and tradition of particular societies, and hence are bound to vary from context to context. Of course, not all of that is, uh, of course, it's, it is not all. Moral and political judgment will also depend on the language and regions of the interpretative framework of each context, um, meaning that effect also, um, uh, sorry, and on top of this, effect of social criticism must derive from the, and resonate from within the habits and traditions of actual people living in specific in times and places, which is the contribution of uh, Michael Waltz. Uh, of course, this debate went on uh, during the 80s and 90s, and uh, because of the failure of the communist bloc and the failure of, of the provision of an alternative to the universal claim of, of uh, human rights, which was uh, liberalism's major success. The debate uh, between communitarianism and liberalism uh, in, in the specific point of 
universalism versus particularism was lost, and uh, which ended up in, in, in indeed having human rights or, or the liberal claim of a universal truth or universal rights winning this debate. Uh, but again, as we see, we've seen in the lectures uh, presented yesterday and uh, in the earlier days, earlier days of this week, we have had the uh, reo uh, reopen the debates about the the cent the central the central role of human rights as a universal uh, feature. So one example of this is the tragedy of human rights uh, as presented by Belligman. And another open uh, debate is uh, that of the Asian values, which um, so-called Asian values, uh, as they are not exclusively Asian, but which have challenged Western style uh, Western style civil and political freedoms. And they claim a special emphasis upon family and social harmony uh, in contraposition of individual rights. And although Asian values have been uh, majorly dismissed by Western liberal liberalism under the premise of self-serving politics, some of these arguments of particularism have still acquired uh, some relevance. And particularly, these are three. Cultural factors may affect the prioritization of rights, that is, willing to sacrifice a social or economic right in cases of conflict with a civil or political right, or vice versa. Uh, cultural factors can also affect the justification of rights, which, uh, for example, certain rights may be justified on the grounds of strengthening ties to such communities, for example, the lack of freedom of speech. Cultural factors can also provide, and this is the last point, uh, moral foundations for a distinctive political practice and for distinctive political practices and institutions. And that is putting at the core care for family or distributed welfare or health systems. And with this first point of uh, universalism versus particularism, I will, I will then uh, pass on the debate over the self to Tassin, to Dr. Tassin. Thank you. Your mic, Tassin, your microphone. Tassin, your microphone. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I can I can see some familiar faces. Giancarlo Bossetti and Professor Francesco. Professor Ferrara, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, we were um, actually, we were discussing about um, uh, some communitarian uh, angles to discuss uh, in terms of uh, how uh, Charles Taylor uh, has been able to propound uh, this particular de debate. And uh, uh, the debate actually highlights uh, the liberal versus the communitarian approach um, with an essential focus on the idea of communitarianism as enunciated by Taylor himself. So what does he actually have to say about it? So um, according to um, Taylor, um, the idea of a communitarian society, essentially on the conception of uh, an importance given to nurturing effective democratic life. Uh, in a strict moralist sense, he believes that the primacy of the ethical and moral norms should be given a preeminence. Uh, Taylor wants us to understand that Western societies are about more than the pursuit of material progress. They are also engaged in a vast collective moral project, enabling individuals to choose their own purposes and take responsibility for their lives. Taylor calls this ideal authority authenticity. However, he insists on the importance of recognizing the choice is freedom, the choice, sorry, the choice and freedom are in fact social goods and not simply individual possessions. To be meaningful and effective for the individual, freedom requires shared standards. These common standards provide a horizon of significance or background against which individual choices take on meaning and become recognized by others. Expressed in language, custom and institutions these significant horizons are embedded in a life of the civil society and provide the vital medium for individual growth and action. According to Taylor, the misunderstanding and failure to consider the collective good stems from the conflicting principles which guide the distinct 
but interpenetrating spheres of the modern life. In short, Charles Taylor identifies three different senses, which is determined in the European political tradition. In a minimal sense, it can exist where there are free associations, not under the tutelage of the state power. In a stronger sense, it can exist where society as a whole can structure itself and coordinate its actions through such as associations which are free of the state's tutelage. So this is what I had to contribute regarding the communitarian approach as envisaged by Charles Taylor. And I think I would like to put up with my other colleague on this debate. Thank you, that's all for me. Yes, hello everybody. I like uh, to contribute uh, regarding our discussion uh, in the um, common good versus individual rights. Um, so while classical liberalism can be viewed as a reaction uh, to centuries of uh, oppressive government, uh, modern communitarianism can be considered as a reaction to, ex to excessive individualism understood by uh, communitarians um, as an emphasis on individual rights, uh, leading people to become somehow selfish. So when it comes to the sense of common good, which is in, uh, we can say, in, in, an, in ordinary political discourse, refers to, the, to those facilities, whether material or in, institutional, that the members of, the, of, a, of a community provide to all members in order to, um, to fulfill a relation uh, obligation, they, will, uh, they all have to care for certain in interests um, that they have in common. So um, in, this, in, the, in this context uh, of common good, regarding common good, uh, benefits, uh, these common good benefits society as a whole, while private goods benefits individuals and sections of society. So the common good points toward, toward the way in which freedom, uh, autonomy, and self-government can be realized by active citizens in the public domain of politics. Um, so in relative to this, um, uh, the main issues underlined by modern communitarian, uh, commun communitarianism in this context uh, where um, that the contemporary liberalism lead to an incoherent notion of the uh, individual as existing outside and apart from society. Um, individual identity is partly constructed by cultural and social um, re relations. Um, so there is no coherent way for formulating individual rights or interest in uh, abstraction from social context. Uh, for example, there is no point in attempting uh, to found uh, a theory of justice for an, um, uh, for, um, on principle that individuals would choose in a, in a hypothetical state of ignorance of their social, economic, and historical circumstances, uh, because simply such individuals cannot exist even in principle. Um, that was uh, my contribution. I'd like to give the word to Giovanna now. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I would like to continue what Amal said about uh, common values within the perspective of Margaret um, and the conception of this in society, in the definition of this uh, of a civilized, civilized society. So a society in, in which the institutional powers do not underestimate, explore, humiliate or exclude the individuals would be, would be considered as a decent or civilized society. And even doctors, for example, would be addressed, uh, would be considered in this kind of um, assessment and evaluation. So in order to assess if a society would be civilized or not, would require uh, uh, an assessment of the common goods and values related to be respected in the interaction, influences, and correlations within others. That, and this would constitute the self-respect in a kind of societal construction of the self. This will also depend on the conditions required by certain society that requires 
and it is influenced by a continuous and historical construction and evolution. So Margalit further uh, brings the, the values of a shared community, so human values and roles, and the very own simplicity of being a human, of having rationality or consciousness, or uh, uh, constructing, a constructing a bond uh, related to trustworthiness and uh, in contradiction uh, with the freedom. Uh, he calls it the family of the man. And the search for being accepted, one of the things that we address in the lectures and, and being embodied agents in a certain society would require for the responsibilities in the context of disruptive changes and irregularities within the framework of analytical processes and objectives and means would have to be addressed. So the touching point uh, related to the liberalism would be the possibility of choices and would depend on a further evaluation as well. So the recognition within the of the self-respect within the society would be related to merits, honors, achievements, references, or rankings, and would be different within a same society, within a same society in itself. Um, further, Margalit addresses the, 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 these concepts in a negative term, in five ways of uh, inhuman treatments that were constructed throughout history. So humans could be first were, were not considered objects, machines, animals, subhumans, and evil or enemies, uh, addressing numbers and tools and flaws in the society. And this would be an easy uh, test to perceive the a kind of awareness and separate the, the good and the bad within the society. So we could consider and, and further assess if uh, a self and individual assessment of the injuries, damages, and offenses could be pursued in this negative approach. F finally, he relates the, the two realities. So the general mor morality would be a set of subtle and relevant correlations of the individual within the community within a, a time link. And ethics would require compassion within the society and a society without a compassion would be a society uh, and uh, an indifferent society. So that's what my contribution was. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we can go on with the second part and we will focus on this uh, in the second part on some constructive uh, proposals. So I'll, I'll introduce and my colleagues will specify. The relationship between the two concepts of freedom set by Berlin, so freedom as non-interference and freedom as self-development needs to be problematized with a focus on the third of the given value of the French Revolution, so fraternity. It is precisely the spirit of social cooperation that turns out to be what can give effectiveness to the two ways of experiencing freedom by activating concrete meanings uh, and by setting an effective recognition of significant others, as will be pointed out by my colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, as a matter of fact, our group has been uh, discussing the issue of humanitarianism, individualism, and the human rights, and how the relationship is governed, and whether communitarianism can, uh, might pose a threat to liberalism, or perhaps might serve the community better than, uh, than uh, liberalism. So, so as a matter of fact, uh, one, of the, one of the debatable issues of social philosophy these days is whether communitarianism or individualism is the more appropriate theory for describing the relationship between the individual and society. Uh, the dispute, in fact, reaches beyond academic social uh, theory to have a direct impact on beliefs, uh, values, and also uh, practices in the, the business world. So, uh, communitarianism developed, in fact, a certain criteria for, uh, let's say, for the formulations of policies uh, that would enable or allow societies to cope with uh, potential conflicts or tensions between, uh, between the common good, on the one hand, and individual rights, uh, including, for example, uh, public health versus individual privacy, 
national security versus individual liberty, etc. So uh, co the communitarian approach, in fact, uh, tries to to challenge this uh, liberal view that uh, that perceives that the political and economic preferences of individuals should be respected, and that the their aggregation should provide uh, a certain guidance to the to the to the government through voting. Uh, it also challenges this liber libertarian position uh, that. That is, it is paternalistic to interfere with individual choices uh, based on personal preferences. So, uh, in keeping with the, this view concerning the social constitution of uh, individual identity, uh, communitarians argue that uh, personal preferences are to uh, a significant extent not, not autonomous, but uh, rather uh, a reflection of, a, of the larger culture as. Aspects uh, we, we can be influenced by uh, non-rational forces. So uh, to conclude, uh, we can say that communitarians, in fact, uh, suggest or argue that that the importance must be given to the society. There must be society is. Uh, local communities, schools, and also uh, uh, places of worship. Where. So, in other words, when to the importance of social norms and informal social controls in uh, fostering pro social conduct and in providing the moral foundations uh, required for successful operation of both uh, governments on the one hand and the markets. Uh, thank you. I'll give the floor to my friend to continue. Thank you, Mohammed. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. So last night when we were thinking about how to move the debate onwards, we of course realized that this is not a kind of debate which can be resolved by choosing a side once, once, once for all. And of course, it's much more productive to think of how to provide the ground to, to sustain our, our life in, with the multiple communities. And in that regard, I'd like to remind about the idea that has been first expressed by Jacques Maritain in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War in the context of the Declaration on the Human Rights, and then has recently been repeated by Charles Taylor. Let me quote Maritain. So what he says is, I'm quite certain that my way of justifying belief in the rights of man and the ideal of liberty, equality, fraternity is the only way with a firm foundation in truth. This, however, does not prevent me from being in agreement on these practical convictions with people who are certain that their way of justifying them entirely different from mine or opposed to mine is equally the only way founded upon truth. So the implication would be that uh, within what, what, whatever are the, the, the intellectual traditions or, or discursive communities where we belong, we need to look for the resources to support, uh, to endorse the liberal polity and, and liberal uh, uh, commitments therein. And this is, of course, not an easy thing to do, and there will be tensions, uh, but in this world, that's the, the challenge and the task that for the intellectuals seems to be worth it to commit themselves to. Thank you. With that, I turn it over to, to Davide. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Um, am I audible as well? You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll try to keep this brief so that uh, we can finalize it. But um, so, how do we go beyond the communitarian liberal divide? Um, as as Professor Volker Kahl says, of course, in his article, uh, the communitarian critique is like the pleading of trousers. It's transient, but it's certain to return. I mean, it will never go old fashioned. But, anyways, as my colleagues have said, um, we need some middle point to understand. Um, how to better combine these two things, because as, as the main central um, factor we discovered is that communitarianism in itself does not propose a theory per se that would go and, and substitute completely liberalism as, for example, I don't know, communism would be for capitalism, but it's a way of, uh, of basically highlighting the lacks that the liberal society has brought forward up until now. 
So I just wanted to recapitulate very briefly the two communitarian critiques that I uh, really found interesting that were also said by the group before. The first one is that liberalism increases uncertainty and restricts freedom of choice. So the answer to this, to go beyond this, uh, would be, in my understanding, Amartya Sen's capability approach to a liberal society. So basically uh, ensuring that in a particular state, people have equality of access to functionings that basically are choices, that this access to choices is named the capability of a person. So uh, basically the ability to read of a person unlocks certain functionings that without that particular ability, you wouldn't be able to do that. And ensuring the equality of this would be a step forward to actually reduce uh, uncertainty and increase the freedom of choice and equalize it. Um, of course, how do you do this? It's very difficult. It's, it's already been theorized, but I believe that um, a main source that we understand is worthy of attention even today is uh, the welfare state. So the welfare state is basically uh, the factor that joins a community that is namely the nation state that is an old concept, but anyways gives to that community the potential and the possibility of implementing human rights. Therefore, I mean, it could be a combination of these things and, and, have, it, and have the welfare state go towards a capability approach would, would actually resolve the first communitarian critique, at least in theoretical manner, then we can talk about this, but I mean, it's, it's just very theoretical. The second communitarian critique I wanted to address is that liberal theory misrepresents real life. Uh, men and women cut loose from all social ties, or um, as, as it said, literally unencumbered, they do not exist, basically. A man is a social being, and we're more often alone without a community nowadays uh, that gives us aid, welfare, and friendship. And this claim echoes uh, the article of Seligman on the tragedy of human rights. Uh, basically, the argument goes uh, as half a century of advocating human rights uh, to the exclusion of other components of, of human goods and fulfillment has, has brought us to a lack. And this normative monopoly of the universalism of human rights engenders a shift from, from the communitarian trust that would be shared dispositions, uh, more community, peace, familiarity, solidarity, as it's been said before, to more of a world of confidence and rights. So where you have multicultural values, community of rights, but also um, uh, the perception of the other seen as a danger and as an impingement of the fruition of the right. So, I mean, to these, to these two challenges, I, I, I really understand, I mean, even in the context of the COVID crisis, I, uh, I really understand that it's true. I mean, we're more alone than ever in this, in this scenario, and we need institutions that are basically uh, the ones that cope with these two lacks that, that would br bring forward uh, the Amartya Sen's capability approach and actually try also, I mean, to enact, um, um, let's say, uh, getting back to a more trustworthy scenario that could institutionalize community within the human rights context. And that would be the end. Thank you. Great. So thank you very much, Davide. So I think we started with considerations on social democracy by Michael Walzer, and we ended on a note on the welfare state. So, um, so we have gone a little bit beyond time, but if there are questions, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to take them. Are there, <clears throat> from the participants, are there any, you know, uh, question on, on, on this debate between liberals and communitarians and how, how we can be, go beyond it? So if not, if not, then I would thank everyone. I would thank the participants of the summer school for the participation, for their great participation, for all the contributions and the discussions that they have made. It's been, uh, it's been very nice. And I would thank also the leaders of the two workshops, Albina and Jonathan, for their contributions. And uh, I would then give the floor to Giancarlo, who will say the closing notes. Thank you, Volker. So the closing up will be very short. Uh, I, I've seen we can uh, say that we are very uh, happy of having seen how uh, 
you did a serious work. We have been able to make a serious work. Uh, or thought we are uh, working in this way, which is now many of you, practically all of you now we have a good, uh, 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 quite a good habit to work this way. The work has been serious. Also the part of the work made not only by our speakers that you know, we are, well, that we know are very, very, very special people we have gathered here, but also by the young scholar and students that has been gathered uh, by our by our by our seminar with our our school. Uh, I've seen that more than the past, there are some more Italian students and young scholars. I don't I don't realize how be now we have more people coming from far away when you are in Venice. Um, and now we have many of them are still very international, distributed every, everywhere, every part of the world, but we have some more students probably connected to Kafoski. That means that our, our collaboration with uh, University of Venice is, is growing. Um, and I'm happy for that, growing not only with the participation of the professor, uh, and the people leading the University of California, but also with, with uh, a growing number of uh, their students. But that, that's a good thing we are, I'm also happy of. Now, uh, what can I say? Well, the work has been very intense. Um, also perhaps being here in Zoom, no one could go down downstairs and take evaporato, that the evaporator is coming there every 10 minutes. And so people can reach San Marco and then Venice. There's no chance to do that. I'm sorry for you, but uh, that has allowed you to work very, in a very intense way. So we are satisfied now. What's coming now, Jonathan? What can we say now? What's, what's coming next is to, we have to reflect to the plans for the future that we hope to be able to be next time in Venice. Um, uh, certainly, will 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 won't miss a visit, a very intense visit to the island um, where there is a little museum explaining how Venice used to deal with the uh, with the um, uh, black beast uh, centuries ago, and um, which is a very uh, an issue, very very uh, interesting. Uh, how they used to quarantine not only not only uh, people uh, but also uh, also uh, also things the things that have to be waited arriving from everywhere before before being sold in the in the in in, in the city uh, uh, no no we we <laughs> couldn't imagine that that uh, that uh, visit uh, we have a, a, a good article on that in our in our website. Um, we couldn't imagine that would have been a topics that we have to deal with now uh, and then. And now we have to. Uh, we'll do that. Um, and so I want to say thanks to everyone uh, of you, uh, speakers, professor, and uh, and uh, young scholars and students and I want to invite you to follow us in our uh, website and to keep informed about, about our next moves. Uh, I'll be happy to see all of you again uh, in our future, so. And I would just, I would add my, add my thanks to, um, to Sofia uh, Di Benedetto and Marco Lucidi in Right, 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 everything went so well, no? There was no, no stamp, no, no, was, no words a, in the organization, which is even more fluent than in the reality, you know? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, I, I'll let Volker um, give, give the final word about the summer school, since I know that we will be continuing our interactions beyond um, after this week uh, and you'll be writing papers, but I'll, I'll let Volker, I'll just say thank you again to everybody for being a part of this. We encourage you to, you know, obviously stay on our email lists, um, write for our website uh, and, and, and to apply for our seminars in the future. Um, uh, and I look forward to staying in touch with, with many of you. Um, and let me just hand it over to, to Volker. Okay, just Great. short message thing, Giancarlo. Yes, uh, 
no, no more messages, just goodbye and <laughs> to no, no, just just I want to tell you the students, I'm going to through Marco, we're going to send you an email with instructions for the ones who want to get okay, go on, okay? on explain better. That it's you who has to explain that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, it's fine. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the summer school participants. Thank you for the attendees. Thank you for for the speakers who have been great and uh, to 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 participate and for the chairs and for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great. Thank you, Thank you yeah. very Goodbye. much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye Have a great evening, all of you. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Bye, Cassandra. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, David. Muito obrigado, gente. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye bye. Jose, stay there. Thank you, everyone. If people want to stay on, grab a drink. Um, Let's have a bar. This, uh, Giancarlo, we stay on this room or we?